Welcome to HMG Live, a production of HMG Strategy, your global partner helping you reinvent the future of work. Home to the HMG Strategy Top Technology Executives to Watch Awards, and also offering the HMG Marketplace, a fast, easy, safe, and efficient way to connect with the right vendors for your technology needs. We can't be together at these events, right? But I think the next best thing is being able to connect through the marketplace. And now, a warm welcome to today's host, lead principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the 2020 Houston CIO Executive Leadership Summit. My team and I are delighted to be here today, really excited. Uh, I was reviewing the agenda on prep for today's uh, summit. I think it's a world-class agenda, folks. This might be the best summit we pulled together in 12 years working with closely with the Houston SIM chapter, as well as uh, our advisory board. A big shout out to Datastax. For those of you who don't know Datastax, it's a fascinating company. Datastax is a company behind the massively scalable, highly available cloud-native NOSQL data platform built on Apache. Datastax gives users and enterprise the freedom to run data in any cloud or any global scale with zero downtime and zero lock-in. More than 450, true, more than 450 of the world's leading enterprises, including Capital One, Cisco, Comcast, Delta Airlines, Macy's, McDonald's, Safeway, Sony, and Walmart use Datastax to build transformational data, data ar architectures for real-world outcomes. When they reach out to you, please uh, set up a, a meeting. Uh, we really, truly appreciate Datastax and uh, our partners here today. And uh, next up, uh, in addition to Datastax, Remedy Street uh, is, a, is a supporting partner for us. Uh, really appreciate Remedy's uh, actually national, uh, national sponsorship program. So a big shout out to the Houston Sim Chapter and Gene Janizowski. Gene, welcome to the program. Great to see you. Thank you, Hunter. Well, appreciate you having us. You know, we really enjoyed our long partnership with you over the years. You say we've been about 10 or 12 years. Um, I've attended quite a few of your conferences all over the country, and we certainly appreciate you being here in Houston and look forward to many more years. So um, I'm the VP. Go ahead. After you. I'm the VP of membership for the local SIM Houston chapter, as well as the national chapter. We have about uh, 45 chapters throughout the US um, and about 5,000 members nationally. And in Houston, we're over 200 members. Our group is really about connecting uh, leaders. Uh, you know, I, I think more now than ever in our pan pandemic, um, it's about connections. People wanna hear about what other people are doing. We're going through difficult times. We have a lot of changes, a lot of new things for people that have never faced before. What better way to have a great network of people you can talk to that are your peers um, I give a seminar, I give a webinar every month, every second month for uh, Houston, where we really do a whole lot of uh, breadth in our breadth in uh, our organization is, is wide reaching. I want to talk to you today for those that aren't members about a little a couple of things we do. We really are for everyone from uh, all your IT leaders in every aspect, and there's different ways to get involved. Next slide. Okay, so one of the things we do, we're really proud of, is we do a lot of things in community outreach. Uh, this year, we uh, had our, the only in uh, real-time tournament we had with, uh, we met was our golf tournament. And thank you, Hunter, for sponsoring a golf tournament. Sorry you weren't there. We'll hope we'll make it next year. But even this year through a pandemic year, we, we raised over $68,000 for our charities. Um, and uh, we had a great day. It was the first, the only meeting we had this year since February. But um, we get involved in a whole lot of areas uh, we have uh, at the college level, at the high school level, middle school level. And we typically give about, about $150,000 a year away to these, to these groups. And uh, this year is not as much, but we've only had one, one uh, function. So we, uh, we do a lot of mentoring. We do a lot of uh, advisory committees. So there's a great way to give oh, gee, the off reach and get our STEM leaders back, uh, get our leadership and uh, the students involved in technology. Next slide. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about a little bit before we go, I want to, I really want you to consider joining uh, SIM. If you're not, I do a webinar, like I said, once a month, I'll send everybody an invitation to show you all the things we do. But just to mention a few other things we do, uh, we have a Toastmasters group. You want to improve upon your communication, your, your speaking. 
our Toastmasters group is free to our members. We have CIO breakfasts that allow people uh, to go ahead and get involved in, uh, and so CIOs just meet and talk of areas of their concerns. We have a bunch of symposiums. We're meeting virtually right now. We haven't met in person, but we had over 45 different uh, virtual meetings uh, over the last couple of months. So uh, we still are uh, contacting people and doing a lot of things. We have an MIT group and career development group, uh, RLF program, executive RLF program. And one of the key points of our group too is also our SIG meetings. We allow people who are project managers, cyber, people who have uh, cybersecurity or, or, or data interest, we have SIGs that meet every month uh, talking about those areas. A lot of ways to get involved in SIM. Again, thank you, Hunter, for our involvement. Um, so we want you to get connected, get involved, and make a difference in our community. Uh, if, and we'll send out invites to you to our next meeting. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Gene. Great job. And next up, we have Mark Taylor. Mark's the uh, CEO of SIM International. Mark? Hey, Hunter, good to see you. And thanks for hosting the event again this year. Great partnership. The team with Gene and George Crawford, along with Antonio Marin and, uh, and Jesse Creo, have built a great community of leaders in Houston and encourage everyone to connect with them, as Gene has shown. They got a lot going on. I had a chance to be with them at their events, uh, their golf tournament just recently. They had 120 folks show up for that, raised 68,000 bucks, and they're having a great impact on their community. Hunter, thanks for your continued investment here in Houston and uh, throughout the SIM community uh, across the uh, SIM nation, right, across the entire country. Thanks, Hunter. Excellent. Great to see you. Thanks, Mark. You too. Hey, so uh, in the chat, there's a link. You can uh, actually uh, be involved with one of our partner companies, Zendesk. Uh, we're doing a survey for them. Um, how are you encouraging your employees to stay engaged, creating a culture of empathy in uncertain times? So please fill out the survey. Uh, you'll land a, a raffle prize drawing, as well as you'll receive a report once the report's ready. Uh, and a, a, a shout out to the HMG Marketplace. We'll see a video here in a minute, I think, on it. Uh, the Marketplace really is a way to get uh, connected to some top tech, top tier uh, technology provi providers from around the world, many of them from the Valley, uh, Appian, Ariaco, Awake, Darktrace, Forescout, Globon, Obsidian, PagerDuty, Sonotype, Tanium, and Tessian are all in the marketplace. So uh, we're going to do a little pop-up quiz here. We're looking to refine the uh, marketplace's focus. What are your organization's specific technology needs now? If you could uh, simply vote and submit, that'd be great. And uh, recognition is important, right? We think it's critically important uh, in our regional markets, but most, most importantly now in a work from home environment or work from anywhere environment, our global platform. Uh, really excited about our regional recognition program, our regional nomination program. So we'll be looking for regional champions today and going forward. So if you're interested to learn more, please reach out to us, to me. Um, but more, more importantly is to help elevate your brand, elevate your uh, posture on the global, on the our worldwide uh, network, our global platform uh, to give you re the recognition that you deserve. So play the, uh, the video asset, please. Later in today's program, HMG Strategy founder and CEO Hunter Muller will proudly recognize and honor global technology executives who matter. These top-tier CIOs, CISOs, and other technology executives have genuinely distinguished themselves in business transformation, digital disruption, innovation, and talent development through even the most difficult circumstances. These awards are not given lightly. They are earned. Recipients join an elite community of forward-thinking global technology executives in the HMG strategy community. We are delighted to celebrate these exemplary leaders and their teams who have delivered unparalleled value to their organizations, their communities, and our world. Please stay with us for the award ceremony and meet the 2020 Global Technology Executives Who Matter. So we'll be recognizing a couple of uh, your folks, uh, your peers in the, uh, at the recognition program at the very end. Please stay to the end of the program. Hey, first up for the program, we have uh, Meredith Harper. Meredith is the VP and CISO at Eli Lilly and Company. Meredith, great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thank you so much for having me. How's the video feed? Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can Excellent. hear you well. 
Yeah. Hey, we're in really unusual times. When the country shut down right around March of this earlier this year, we were at a summit in Orlando, uh, actually with the three Florida SIM chapters, Southern, Mid, and uh, Tampa Bay um, uh, SIM chapters. And specifically, I had this feeling. I said I, on stage, I said, what we're going to walk through and go through today and into the future will be unprecedented in our, in our professional history. And so what got you here today is going to be very different than what the kind of leading uh, leadership skills you need, the kind of business skills you need, the kind of organization skills you need will be dramatically different from the, from the next day onward into this new now crisis of seven, eight months pandemic. What changed for you back, uh, say, eight months ago from the, from eight months ago to now, Meredith? Um, great question. Um, actually, what changed for us as an organization was just the external um, pressures that we were seeing our team members have to now juggle, that we didn't necessarily have that as a part of the equation before. Um, yes, we had team members with children. Yes, we had team members with parents that they were helping to care for. Uh, yes, we had team members that were traversing their various communities, uh, going about their daily lives, and then coming into a physical place to carry out the business of Lily. But when we got to about March 8th or 7th or 8th and, and the decision was made to move all of our team members home, uh, that created an entirely different scenario in terms of what our team members now have to juggle. So they became instantly online teachers. They became instantly uh, still caregivers for their parents, but doing it in the same space where they're actually living in some instances. So all of those pressures that seemingly were external have now been brought into the work, the new workplace. And now there's a juggle that's happening. How do we continue to drive forth the mission of Lilly continue to develop medicines for people around the world, but also understand that our team members are now experiencing a level of stress that wasn't necessarily there before. So we had to start to think differently around the health and well-being of our team members and how to help create balance in those spaces. And Meredith, you're a pretty large organization. Uh, give us an idea of the scale and the kind of business Eli Lilly's in. So uh, Eli Lilly Life Sciences Organization, uh, we're in drug development as well as medical device, medical device development, 34,000 team members around the world. Um, probably I wanna say 60% of those individuals are actually resident here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, so we are heavily involved in um, the support for COVID as well, not only for our state, but also for uh, the industry as a whole and for the communities as a whole. So we're, we're playing our role there. Um, a lot of moving pieces. We are in multiple countries. Uh, so there's jurisdictions that we have to deal with. And then also thinking about how has the crisis, the pandemic, not only impacted us in the US, but how has it impacted our team members that are sitting in other geographies as well? So this just wasn't a Indianapolis US based uh, issue. We were looking at this worldwide. How are our team members in China? Um, how are they uh, addressing this? How are we doing in France? I mean, there's all these areas where we had to address that. So very big company, a lot of moving pieces. So thank you for the uh, detailed answer. Hey, you know, when you think about the whole idea of diversity and inclusion, um, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you orient orientate yourself to d uh, diversity and what's your, what's your approach? So diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a part of my brand for years. I feel that being a woman, specifically a Black woman in this space, um, has been interesting for the last 27 years that I've been doing this. And just paralleling um, the experience of me walking into my first uh, real job out of college and being the second African-American ever hired for the company that I was working for. And so this was in the early 90s that I am now the second. Um, kind of shocked me in that instance. Um, but it's part of my brand and it's something that I continuously push because as we have evolved as an industry, um, we have seen more women than say uh, 25, 30 years ago, but we still have a diversity challenge and in diversity in terms of race, um, I think we have a lot of work that we need to do there. Um, I would love to say that I walk in a room and I'm no longer the unicorn, but I am because you don't typically see uh, black women in these spaces. Um, so, so I think that I try to make sure that that's part of my discussions, my leadership style. How am I opening up doors for underrepresented populations? How am I supporting women in the workplace, especially in tech? And then how am I working with my male allies to help sponsor and support support women and minorities as they move into these spaces. I think we have to have a very different conversation than what we've been having prior to this. 
Um, one, we need to be transparent and acknowledge that there's an issue. Uh, two, we have to stop thinking about the simplistic ways of us to, to, to address diversity and inclusion issues. Um, mentoring programs, awesome, wonderful, but we don't need any more of them. We don't need any more mentoring programs. What we need is access to roles and opportunity. And so we have to now start opening up those doors. And that's what I'm trying to push, not only at Lilly, but also as I'm working in the community. What does that look like, access to roles and opportunities? Um, we've been working with a group out of uh, New York, Empower, for a long time, mm -hmm. working with kids in crisis between 18 and 23, mm -hmm. uh, kids in the inner city, uh, looking for that opportunity, right? And or Genesis Works, right, based in Houston. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's two pieces to it. I think that there is the initial exposure that we owe it to uh, various communities to expose them to the opportunities and possibilities of what a STEM career could be, right? So but getting with the kids is great because I think you have to touch them earlier. We can't just start talking about women and minorities, uh, talking to women and minorities in their college age about coming into say security, right? We gotta start that much earlier. So I think having those programs that we could either support or manage, facilitate, or whatever we can do to keep those going, I think that's important for us to do. I think the second part of that statement and what that looks like for me when I talk about access is if we are in a position where we have a role and we're recruiting for that role and we don't have a diverse candidate pool to pull from, how can we really say that we are focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion? So looking at those those, uh, those segments of our, our communities where we can find the talent, we have to go after that. So using an example, if we are looking for African-American talent and we're going to the University of Iowa, we probably won't find it. But if we're looking for that talent and we go to Florida a and University or to North Carolina a and or Howard, we will find it. So I think that we have to target our, our efforts in a different way to be able to have access and exposure to those talent pools that we don't typically see. So where would you say uh, Eli Lilly is in this whole uh, progression or uh, let's call it maturity of uh, diversity? I think Eli Lilly has done an amazing job and I, I, I'm not saying that just because I'm biased and I work for them, but honestly, when I was looking at this opportunity with, with Lilly, I was also entertaining other um, opportunities as well. The deciding factor for me was the fact that Lilly was very clear on their diversity, equity, and inclusion perspectives and what they're tangibly doing to be able to address those disparities, right? So they were talking to me about that as I was interviewing with them. And to me, that was the, the deciding factor. Um, we have been really in the forefront uh, lately, especially um, coming behind the George Floyd incident. Um, Lilly has been very vocal, not only about giving our team members space, safe spaces to have these conversations around um, racial injustice and social injustice and being able to do that as a company and as a team, we've been able to do that together, which is much different than what I've ever seen in my career. Uh, we've never really had honest conversations around race and diversity um, the way that we're having them now. So I appreciate Lily's perspective on that. I think that our CEO, Dave Ricks, is modeling um, wonderful behavior in terms of what a good corporate citizen looks like as it relates to driving forth these, these, um, these discussions in the community. So there have been some commitments that Lily has made. Um, we have pledged $25 million towards social injustice um, causes, organizations like the um, National Urban League that needs help and funding and support to be able to break down some of those barriers. We've also donated and um, offered up 25,000 um, volunteer hours of team members time and, and talent and all of that for them to be able to get in the streets and really start to help our community have these discussions um, um, in, a, in a better way. You know, final kind of comment, uh, Meredith, great story. Um, what is it like for you leading in these challenging times? I think that it's, it's stretched all of us. Uh, I, I think that I, I, I would wanna say that I have always been a, a, a fairly engaged leader with my team not micromanaging, but a very engaged leader. But it's, it's allowed me to lean in a little bit more. Um, it's allowed me to think about not only the way that my team members deliver, um, which they have been doing at an enormous rate, which I, I'm, I'm happy about, but I'm also concerned about the impact that, that that's having on them. So I'm having to think more about well-being and balance than I can say we were probably thinking about a year ago, because again, those external pressures are now being brought into our new work workplaces. So it's changed me in that regard. Um, I think that I listen a little bit more now. 
and uh, want to hear people's lived experiences around certain topics that we haven't been used to discussing in the workplace. So it's changed the way that I've interacted. I've always been act active with my team, but it's changed the way that I've done it. Hey, Meredith, thanks so much for coming on the program today and coming to Houston with us. And, uh, you. and you've really given a great gift of thought leadership to our Houston friends. Thank you. I appreciate is, you. And thank you for having me today. This has been excellent. I love to interview you for my new book, Book 7. As awesome. Well as, uh, we have a Women in Technology Summit coming up. I'll have Melissa Moore and my team reach out to you. I think you'd be awesome to be part of that global summit. Thank you. Whatever you need, I'm here to help the community. Awesome. Thanks, Meredith. Take right. care. Have a good one. Have a good one. Hey, next up we have uh, John Barkey. John's the vice president at, uh, I'm sorry, Enterprise Digital Services at Waste Management. John, great to see you. How are you doing today, Hunter? I'm excellent. Um, hey, thanks for being on, coming on the program. Tell us a little bit about Waste for those folks who don't know about Waste, the size, the scale, and the scope that you're working on. Sure, yeah. So Waste Management uh, is about a $50 billion organization, Fortune 200-ish, and uh, operating in North America with about uh, 50,000 um, employees. And it's uh, in many dimensions is the leader in the environmental services uh, business, whether it's around uh, taking away in uh, trash or uh, recycling uh, based here in Houston. So th thanks, what, John, what's changed for you in the last seven months? What, what were you able to get done or get pushed through that would never would have happened without a crisis like the pandemic? Yeah, you know, um, it, um, before the pandemic, we already had a full agenda. So we were doing everything from changing out our ERP platforms to uh, moving data centers to rolling out new technologies on uh, trash trucks. So video cameras on trucks that do all kinds of things, identifying new opportunities for revenue and uh, other capabilities, uh, remote controlled uh, bulldozers that move trash around uh, in a landfill. So uh, we, have, we have things going on um, uh, across the organization. But once the, the pandemic hit, you know, we had to, as many people did, pivot quickly. And we had about 20,000 people that were working in offices that needed to go home. Um, our, our business is an essential business. So we had to continue, as you probably saw on your front door, you know, we had to continue picking up trash everywhere. Uh, but the folks that were in the offices, we needed to do something with them and, and, um, and we needed to do it quickly. And so uh, what typically would have taken as many people have faced uh, months to do properly, we did it in days and moved these 20,000 people uh, to working from home. And, and as part of that process, um, the com company became a lot more comfortable with working iteratively in, uh, as opposed to having a you know, typical, what I'd say is a waterfall type of project where let's plan this out and and do this instead, we were iterating and sometimes making mistakes along the way. Um, and there was a lot of forgiveness for that. And I, I mentioned this to you because this was the impetus for what we did next. So recognizing how quickly the organization and our, and our team, which we call the digital team, responded to that, they said, you know what, if we could focus our energies on something and, um, and work in an iterative way, I think we could do some really big things. So in the midst of this, uh, of this crisis, we launched the largest digital transformation effort in our company's history, uh, a multi-year program. And instead of doing the uh, six months or a year of planning, we said uh, we had six days of planning and we said, let's go. And we, we launched this thing, which was focused on the customer and improving the customer's experience and working from the customer and working way back and so there's a number of processes inside of our company that are less than optimal that we could address. So we, we spun up this whole, whole transformation program to improve our company's, uh, uh, the way that we interact with our customer in the midst of this crisis, which, you know, that's typically not the thing you do. But the idea being, once we come out of this crisis, then, you know, we've distanced ourselves even more uh, from our competitors and come out even stronger. Well, it sounds like you guys went with a, a a top-down, right? Big picture approach. Uh, here's your current go-to-market. And then you reimagined the future uh, customer experience and where you wanted to take it, right? Redefining that open space. That's exactly right. And I think uh, the, the key word I'll, I'll peg off there, Hunter, is top-down. You know, oftentimes um, when we're doing our planning, you get a million requests. You know, we'll have, we'll have hundreds of requests from different places in the organization of things we want to have, that want to have done. And all of them 
are really good things to do. I mean, so there's not a bad one in the bunch. The challenge is wading through all of that and getting to the ones that have the biggest impact. And instead of starting from the bottom up, what we did was start from the top down. We brought together the leadership team of the company and said, what is it we should focus on? And we created a list of criteria of, you know, it needs to be customer focused, it needs to make us agile, yeah, and so forth and so on. And then we said, so what is it of the things that we could do that would do that? And we put together this program um, that's around the customer and improving the customer journey. Again, and there's other things we're already doing, but this was the area that was gonna make the biggest impact, the biggest impact to our employees and our employee experience the biggest impact to our customers and the customer experience, and then ultimately in our shareholders experience. And so that's where we focused our energies. Instead of being distracted with all the little things, we focused on what's most important. A little bit, John, a little bit about your role in digital services. What is it, what's the scope of that? And how do you map to the CTO, CISO and CIO? Yeah, so my role is effectively a CIO role. We just don't call it that in our organization. So I've got, um, uh, accountability for all the application development, infrastructure, uh, security, um, but we just don't have the CIO uh, title in our organization. That's an ex a great uh, title to have, right? That's really where the action is. Um, you've had a great career. Give us to help us with some career defining moments when you knew you were walking into a, a, the right situation, the right opportunity. Uh, any uh, tips or uh, clues on how you found success in your career? I mean, for me, uh, and when I was looking at this opportunity, and I'm, uh, I've recently joined Waste Management, it's a little over a year ago. Uh, for me, I know that I found it when I found a place that uh, is an organization that has a mission and a, uh, a purpose that I believe in, uh, as well as an organization that has a set of values that align with mine. And, and Waste Management is a great organization in that it's an employee first, very familial type of a culture. So for me, it's a place that has the values of integrity and, and a meritocracy and, and, and the ways that I like to work. Um, and, and thirdly, it's a place where technology matters. Uh, we have in our organization um, four strategic pillars. They're about the employee, technology, about our protecting our assets and growth. And so number two in that list is around technology. And for me, you know, I, I, I don't wanna go to some place and run the help desk and nothing wrong with the help desk, but, that's not the job I want to do. I want to do something interesting that's going to move the needle and make an impact. And to go to an organization where technology matters uh, is important. And so I say that because those are the kinds of environments where you believe in what's being done, the, uh, the values are in alignment, and where technology matters, you know, then, you know, the, the, the world is your oyster and you know, there's no limit to what you could do. John, what, was, what is the mission of uh, waste management? I mean, it's about uh, around the mission and the thing that really resonates with me is around sustainability. So you think about a, a trash company, but we're often at the top of the list of uh, sustainability. We have a sustainability conference that we have annually. We have the largest sustainable sporting event uh, in the world, which is the uh, Phoenix Open a golf event there where we produce nothing that goes into a landfill. Even the building, actually we're moving into a new building that is the most sustainable building you'd say in the US. It's a Bank of America building in uh, downtown Houston. So it's all about sustainability. And even though you're putting trash in the ground, we do it in a way that's very sustainable. We're capturing the methane from it. And uh, we have power plants in our many of our landfills that are powering homes in the neighboring communities from, from the, uh, the waste methane that comes from it. So for me, it's about doing things right and doing things right for the environment. And I'm glad to be part of that kind of a mission. Hey John, thanks for coming on the program today. This is a great, uh, a great interview. Uh, I'd love to follow up with an interview for my new book and uh, possibly highlight you in one of our global summits. Great. Good speaking with you, Hunter, and have a good day. Great. Take care. Bye now. Next up, we have Kathy Van Langdingham. Uh, she's the new CIO, congratulations, of Lionel Bussell. Thank you very much, Hunter. Very nice to be here with you today. Hey, great, uh, great to be here with you as well, Kathy. Tell us a little bit about your story the last year or two and uh, the recent uh, role uh, of promotion. Congratulations. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, um, well, I've been with Lion Del Bazell for too many years to say, and for most of my career, Lion Del Bazell are predecessor companies. And um, I have really been throughout my career, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but throughout my career, I've really been in the business. So most of my career on the customer side of supply chain 
and uh, did a little stint in procurement. And just in the last few years, I've been in the IT organization kind of translating the business needs to the te technical needs and trying to get those aligned. So early this year, I got an opportunity to step into the CIO role and, um, and now I'm, I'm the formal, former, formal CIO, so thank you. Congratulations, you know, you have a lot going on. Tell us about uh, the IT transformation project that you're currently leading. Sure, sure. So as we, uh, we started this year, we had our IT strategy that has three pillars, which include driving IT excellence through our people, enabling digital through technology excellence, and unlocking value through business partnership. So as one of our first actions early this year, we transitioned the IT organization from a project focus to a product focus. And so this was really included a shift in our culture to focus our IT efforts on outcome and value creation. So where we used to maybe celebrate output, we had, we had delivered a solution. Now we celebrate when we really deliver the value, when we get real adoption. So, you know, early this year, even as we all went remote in Europe and Houston and we were shut down, uh, we went forward with this change. So we went right head into it. And like many of us, many of our companies, we were reevaluating our work and our projects. Our company made a decision to accelerate projects that delivered value, and we've been highly successful in this space. So our reorganization and our realignment has really made us successful in removing silos and empowering self-directed teams to prioritize and resolve issues with our business stakeholders. Interesting, interesting stuff. And you work closely with uh, our good friend Anoop, I, I think, I right? do, I do. I'm in Anoop's organization. Anoop leads our global business services organization. And we have four pillars in our organization. So the IT organization is one of them. We have a digital transformation group. We have our cybersecurity organization and we have a, a um, procurement organization. You know, Kathy, you know, it's, it's, we don't often do this. I don't often do this, but Anoop's a, a very interesting individual. He's a, <laughs> really a great world-class global executive, right? And yes. you yes. probably uh, have a close relationship with him. What is that? What's that? When do you know you have the right relationship with your leader and what does it feel like? And, and how do you, how do you get along? Um, so, you know, Anoop is a special guy, as you say, and he's done a great job of building a team that really trusts each other. We're able to be honest, completely honest with each other. And, and honestly, I've never been quite on a team like this. So it's energizing, every day is exciting. Sometimes uh, for, for you, Hunter, you probably know, you, we, can, we use a noop sometime as a verb. We say we've been a nooped when he's excited about something and, and he gets us going on something, but, uh, but, but it's, been, it's been a great experience. Excellent. And I understand you've been working quite a bit on the application layer. What have you been doing to be modernizing it? Right. So um, another big effort that we started as part of our IT strategy and fundamental really to technology excellence is we've been focused on reducing our technical debt. And we've been successful so far in reducing it by roughly 40% from, from over 2,500 applications by the end of this year, we'll be at 1,500 application, and we have an in-state target of less than 1,000. And as, as all my fellow CIOs know, this is fundamental to implementing our cloud strategy and uh, being successful there. Awesome stuff, right? And I understand you're also transforming your service delivery and infrastructure organizations. You, you're busy. You have a lot going on. We do, and you know, it's been so exciting. Um, but we, we are transitioning to a more to the more modern ServiceNow platform. We're implementing key automations. We're transitioning our infrastructure to a hybrid cloud consumption model with a reduced data center footprint. And um, yeah, so cloud first strategy, we're, we're on our way. Sounds pretty exciting. What would you say your biggest challenge is today as a leader? So, you know, um, I have a global uh, IT organization um, with between 500 and 700 folks, if I include all of our employees and all of our contractors around the world. And um, being new in this role, I completely realize now as we work to change the culture, I have a fantastic uh, leadership team and we, we are very aligned 
in, in moving the culture. But the only way we'll really be successful is if I get to and I, I can be inclusive, right, of all 500 to 700 people. Um, that, that's how uh, we will really be successful uh, in, in executing our strategy and, and delivering to the business. So you're working, uh, you have literally, obviously, IT operations around the world, 24-7, 365. Exactly, exactly. That must really be an interesting layer of complexity, both the global reach as well as uh, the cultural differences. Well, well, sure. But you know what? That's also what's going to make us successful. If I can really leverage that diversity and that diversity of thinking, then we will really be successful. So it's, it's key. Great story. Hey, Kathy, what would you say is your mantra, your go-to one, three things that you really pride yourself when you think of yourself as a leader uh, in business, a leader in the C-suite, a leader uh, in the boardroom, a leader in IT? Yeah, so, you know, so, so first of all, I want to engage with my people. I want to talk to my people. I want to listen to my people um, to, and, you know, hear what they're concerned about. Um, I also, um, I, you know, I'm not technical. So I really try to put, put things into simple English. I say that all the time to my folks. I'm not technical. You got to be able to explain it to me or you can't explain it to our CEO and, and our business leaders. Um, so so we, really, we really like to, uh, to put things simply so it's well understood. But you know, also I'm not afraid to get into the details and, and really drive value. Awesome. Hey, Kathy, thanks so much for coming on the program. And I can see you as part of our women, Global Women in Technology Summit in a few weeks. Uh, you'd be a great, that would be great. You'd be a great player there, and I'd love to interview you as well. So thank I'll, you, Hunter. We'll be in touch. Great job. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Hey, next up we have uh, reimagining the business and the future of work panel, uh, a real a rock star panel here. Um, gentlemen, you can turn your cameras on. Why don't we start with Dave? Uh, Dave Harder, Vice President of Information Technology at High Crush. Uh, hey, Dave, welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. It's been so interesting. For those who don't know High Crush, High Crush is? High Crush is a frac sand uh, based company, but we do logistics and equipment leases also. We've also got a small software business that um, we acquired a couple of years ago that helps us be better, but it also has a commercial impact outside of just High Crush. Gotcha. When you think about technologies, uh, to, to ensure your cor corporate culture in this current pandemic, what, what was your go-to? What was uh, your baseline? You know, golly, I think um, just building relationships, keeping relationships going um, from a technology standpoint, um, certainly uh, the use of collaboration tools like Teams or Zoom has been super helpful. Um, you know, as we've migrated back into the office, I think those tools even become more crucial because you've got uh, certain uh, groups of folks who are migrating back to the office or in the office more frequently, but you still have people that have uh, individual concerns about staying uh, distanced and working from home. And so keeping those folks engaged and keeping the culture going forward, that's, to me, that's kind of the key to, to keep the, the results happening. That really is the, the litmus, isn't it? Can you keep people engaged in this uh, hybrid work from home environment, right? Yeah. Excellent. Dave, stay with us. We'll, we'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Hey, Kim, uh, welcome to the program. Kim Holder is the Vice President of DT Corporate Functions at Baker Hughes. Welcome to the program. Oh, welcome. Thank you. And DT stands for, I'm sorry. I, I IT. That. So digital technology. So we call it DT in our organization. Of course. It makes complete sense. That's great. <laughs> and so what's keeping you up at night? What are you, what are you most concerned about? What are you working on now, Kim? Sure. So it's really about the talent. When I think about um, what we would call forward to work versus necessarily future to work, it's not conceptual or far off. I think it's now uh, we're really focused on the talent uh, opportunities that we have, meeting people where they are, um, recognizing that women in our technology field right, are equally impacted as you've seen women be impacted across the more macroeconomic global impacts and really focusing and having conversations about what type of work, what does it look like? How do we want to do that work? Staying engaged with our talent throughout this um, year, which is fundamentally different than any of us um, could plan for. But you know what, in our function, I think we are naturally adaptive. We adapt quickly and we respond quickly. 
What does uh, winning look like for you in this current environment, Kim? And, and how do you keep the team engaged and uh, inspired? Winning from a business continuity perspective or talent? Wherever you want to go, either. Sure. Uh, so I think from a talent perspective, it's retaining our talent, um, especially in this environment uh, where, frankly, many of us know that now we can expand the way that we explore talent. It's not necessarily a team in Houston or a team in Kuala Lumpur. Um, as a global organization, but we can really source talent from anywhere, which means everybody else can as well. So it's maintaining the team structures, uh, making that really alive and really working for the talent that's here and retaining them. And Baker Hughes is pretty built pretty large. How big is the, the, the company? So we're in 120 countries, $24 billion, um, an organization, D2 organization that's over 1,500 people. Uh, so with that type of diversity and coverage, uh, whether it's from out of the rig to working in an office, uh, the amount of different use cases and scenarios are pretty vast for us um, with the four pillar companies that we have. You have an amazing leader that you work with, Jennifer. Um, she yep. is really incredible, right? She, she is. I've been at Baker Hughes two years. I've spent my, most of my career in another organization and I came to Houston uh, last year to work for her. So very excited to be a part of her leadership team. Awesome. Stay with us. I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Uh, hey, Craig McGrath. Craig's a, G Gen a GVP of Global Service Delivery uh, Support at Rimney Street. Craig, great to see you. Hey, Hansa. Great to, great to see you again. You know, you got a couple really interesting questions. Um, when you think about uh, the future, right, of service in the our whole IT industry, what do you what do you what do you think of? And we have a pop up poll over here, right? Yeah, uh, hopefully you guys can answer our poll. That'll be wonderful. So look, I, I think Hunter, we're at a very interesting crossroad for companies that provide customer service. And of course, we've got it in our, in our tagline here, but we're all really in the business of providing customer service. So two quick key observations or predictions. Uh, the first one is I think the pendulum has swung back to return on investment being the number one determining factor for your project. So you've heard great examples so far today from some of the other speakers. Uh, take a listen to the stories and, and see what you experience for your own organization. But in my view, if you can't show return on investment inside the year that you propose the project, reconsider whether it's right for you. And then the second kind of proposal, kind of, you know, uh, forward-looking statement, um, in the support world, you're either bringing clients closer to you or you're deflecting them away. And so we see a lot of technology helping uh, that to happen, uh, online social media, community, even uh, AI solutions. Um, and there'll be some companies who choose to bring their customers closer to them at this time, and then others uh, who uh, choose to deflect. And so I, I, I think, of course, I'm a little biased, I think bringing clients closer is, the, is a winning strategy, um, but time will tell uh, how that uh, pans out for us all. So Craig, you, you run a pretty big organization yourself uh, and you've been working from home for a long, long time. Uh, what did you learn about your teams when you've already been remote? Uh, what did you learn from your team in the, in, in, during the pandemic? Yeah, so when you, when you think about Romini Street providing support for clients using enterprise software, we're providing essential support to companies who provide essential services. So from hospitals, manufacturers of, of the respiratory masks through to retailers, and then even the fast food providers that have been able to be key for all of our sanity, uh, we've been providing that support. And so we knew long ago, you had to distribute the team around the world to provide 24 by seven support. So our engineers are across 17 different countries to deliver that mission. So while COVID is the headline we're all talking about right now, we've had resiliency during hurricanes that have obviously uh, impacted Houston in a big way, wildfires in, in other parts of the world and other regional disturbances. So two key things that, that we've discovered. Uh, the first one, lead by example with video. So if you want to maintain a proper human connection, none of your team out there cares about the occasional family member in the background, you know, <laughs> wandering in and out, or if you've got snowmobile hair, right? Your, your team cares about genuine presence and being present and leading by example with video. And the second part would be for a remote team and for everyone out there who's running remote teams, maybe for the first time for a complete virtual scenario, you really have to measure your team's performance based on outcomes. So give your team the room to move and work. Don't micromanage their time and attendance. Place your trust in the hiring decisions that you made. Uh, and that will absolutely pay off. So uh, some, some tips. Great. Thanks, Craig. Uh, I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Good, good job. We got Paul Kruger coming up. Paul, uh, are you still at JV Poindexter? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm in the early phases of retirement here, Hunter. 
I, I've moved out of my CIO role and am, uh, I kind of liken it to uh, using the patch to quit smoking. I just couldn't do it cold turkey. So I'm, I'm easing out and going to help on the ERP project uh, to get them over the hump with their largest business unit and then right off into the sunset. Awesome. Wow. What a great career. Let's do a reflections, Paul, then on, a, on your career. Any, any thoughts about uh, moves that you made that really de were defining moments? Oh, quite, yeah, definitely coming down to Houston in 97 to become uh, the first CIO for a company uh, at ABB, uh, Vetco Gray, uh, really was a, a turning point for me. Uh, got to get in the oil and gas industry, industry for 20 years. Uh, got to work with a lot of great people and learn uh, a lot about being a CIO over the last 23 years, uh, starting with uh, at ABB. And any tips you'd give to folks that want to become a CIO? I don't believe the, that CIO stands for career is over. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for, for you to uh, be in a CIO and a lot of ways to grow. Excellent. You know, when you think of this current work from home environment, what's the impact now as we go to a hybrid environment and there's going to be a lot of back and forth? So, you know, as far as working from home, there's certain jobs that lend themselves very easily to uh, working from home. Others, not so much, right? So, uh, you know, when you think about uh, for an IT, infrastructure support, uh, you know, you already have the infrastructure team, the help desk team that are uh, supporting remote locations. So whether they do it at home or do it from the office really doesn't make any difference. Where, where it's hard though is uh, with project work and uh, getting that collaboration and working close together and getting those, uh, just those impromptu ideas or being able to quickly grab somebody and talk to them. Uh, so uh, you do need a little bit of this, uh, the ability to get people back together in the office, get people back together in a safe way uh, within a war room or uh, uh, within the office areas to work through these uh, issues and to quickly collaborate. Because uh, on project work, it's the initial meetings by Zoom or WebEx are great. The follow-ups are taken forever. Oh, interesting. Thanks, Paul. Hey, what Ron, I'm sorry, Don, Don Rennie, welcome to the program. Uh, Don's the Vice President of Information Technology at Toyota. What a great organization you work for. Uh, how are you doing today? Excellent, great to meet you. Are you, where are you based? I am based in Houston. So Gulf States, Toyota, we do Texas and the five surrounding states. Okay, gotcha, great. Um, I know some folks up at corporate. Uh, excellent, uh, great company. Uh, when you think about the pandemic and leading out of it, it's a pretty innovative company, Toyota. What, what have you been able to do, accomplish in this pandemic uh, in terms of innovation and changing the agenda for your organization? Yeah, I mean, for us, we were right in the middle when this pandemic started of a big digital transformation effort to get off the mainframe and get on to a modern ERP. And right when we started going, the pandemic happened and we're all working from home panic thought how is this going to work like Paul was talking about with projects but honestly off the bat everybody just jumped in zoom took off and the project was going 100 miles an hour and things were going really well but here we are six months later and I see some of what Paul's talking about creeping in we've had to actually had some in building sessions done safely so that we could get some design meetings done quicker People work really well when everybody's on the Zoom call. And it's going to be interesting. I heard you talk earlier about the hybrid environment we're going to. When everybody's on a Zoom call, it's great. When half the room's in the room and half's on the call, it makes it a little more difficult to make those dynamics work and to use the tools and to get it flowing. But we've been able to keep the morale up, keep people moving. And the question becomes, how long can you keep this going, right? And when do we get back to whatever the new normal is going to be? You know, I was talking to, uh, thanks, Don. I was talking to uh, Jerry Martin Flick Flickinger right in March, April timeframe of the global CTO at Starbucks. She's a good friend. And uh, she said, hey, Hunter, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And coupling that with an article in the journal over the weekend, and they were talking about like full recovery to normal could be as far out as 2024. Don't want to be a downer here on that idea, but the simple vaccine is the first step. It's going to take a herd 
kind of a, a herd a, a immunity that we all get better and it's safe to really return to normal. I mean, what does that mean for you, Don? What are your thoughts on that with that idea? I, you know, for me, we're never going to be 100%, you know, back to normal. So I think the way we're going to have to, we are going to have to adapt to find ways to get the hybrid model to work. You're not going to have everybody in the office and you're not going to have everybody remote. So how can we adapt these tools like Zoom and these other tools, like I said, to work when half the people are in the room and half the people aren't in the room so that you can whiteboard effectively, so you can discuss effectively and have side conversations effectively. And yeah, that- Another station, uh, another program on, and Jamie Diamond was talking about from JP Morgan, the difficulty of ideating and innovating in this you know, digital world, it's really difficult, right? No, it is. And, and we, what we miss the most is you're doing a big project and everybody's working hard and the executive's just stopping by, seeing how it's going or bumping into you in the coffee bar and seeing how it's going. So we've kind of had to get innovative around that and kind of have the executives drop into tag ups in the morning or just stop by some other Zoom calls and see how things are going just to kind of keep that culture moving. Well, you know, people matter, right, in the ideation process. And to your point, it's uh, getting buy-in and support sponsorship from senior level executives in any major initiative is critical, right, and vital to drive it to completion, to success. Would you agree, Craig? Yeah, absolutely. You've, you've got to have senior leaders uh, involved and engaged and, and having that connection, I think, is very important. Otherwise, uh, the teams can feel disconnected from one another. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Kim, over to you. I mean, you must keep Jen involved constantly in your major uh, moves, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, all of our senior leaders have demonstrated and become more accessible. If nothing else, the video environment democratizes access. You know, being really intentional about putting time on the calendar. Don, I loved your idea about being intentional about having a senior leader drop in the same that they would if they were going and walking around the hallways of the uh, the respective office that we're in. I think our senior leaders have been very intentional about their reaching out, their vulnerability. They're talking about when days are not going well <laughs> and uh, they need our support to push through. Uh, so yeah, I think the access that the leaders have um, really fundamentally stepped up and been even more visible in the organization is something that uh, we've been celebrating at Baker Hughes. I mean, when you think of Thank you, Kim. You have a roadmap, you have a, an ideation, and you have a, you have a, you have a, a business plan for the technology uh, initiative. It probably makes sense to also have a relationship map plan and how to include senior level executives at very, at, in timely points, just so you don't get lost with those relationships because you can't have that hallway or that cafeteria discussion. Paul, would you agree? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh... One of the things we've been doing is actually uh, instead of just doing the executive meetings with the uh, uh, with just the leaders, we're actually bringing the team in and letting the team do short presentations so they get that face time in and uh, also get a chance to be with the executives more. So we're changing our meeting formats on, on how we're meeting with the executives in order to uh, you know keep the culture going and keep people engaged and, and seeing the leaders and not always just being uh, on a Zoom meeting with the same people. Interesting. Um, Dave, your, any thoughts on the topic? You know, I think um, everyone has touched on things that I had written down in my notes. You know, it's, it's the ideation of innovative ideas. Hey, what can we do better? It may start off with a discussion about the Astros or something like that, but it leads to, hey, look, what are we doing in the field for this? And how do we make this better? And so I think, you know, the struggle or one of the challenges of, uh, for us as leaders is how do we keep that momentum going, even though those water cooler discussions aren't happening as frequently or doesn't include all the people that are here in the office. And so I think that's just a huge challenge because just because someone chooses to work from home or maybe they're not here on the same days that other folks are, how do you keep that innovative process going um, to drive change, to be better, be more successful? I think, um, you know, as leaders, we're kind of the hub and everyone else is the spoke to some extent on the technology side. And, and we've got to champion those spokes to talk to each other and to be on the same page, 
to keep driving uh, to the same marching orders. Because if you have someone who's a little bit disconnected uh, and they're missing out on some of those watercolor or water cooler discussions, then you got to make sure that they're up to speed and caught up. And so just over communicating to, to my team and, and managing out and up is, is more important than ever. And each little interaction is, is critical. Well, you know, more than ever, right? You guys, are, you're 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 competing on a global sta sta stage too, right? For talent, uh, to keep yeah. people engaged, right? Uh, and people ultimately want to feel appreciated, right? We're all uh, many folks are working from home in challenging scenarios, maybe homeschooling. Uh, it, it can be can get pretty uh, pretty de uh, demanding, uh, both on the professional and personal side. Who wants to talk about creative ways to keep 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 the team engaged and? Uh, uh, making sure they feel valued. Kim, you have uh, any ideas? Craig? Am hey, I yes. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Craig. Craig. Uh, sorry about that. I had a technical difficulty. No, I was just going to say we, we had um, ideas like sending tips cookies, doing something that's sent to everyone's house, having you know, a local chef um, do a dinner hour with all of the group or lunch. So just trying to get back to the human side of the team and the things that we like to do were just some fun ideas. We also have a very strong leading and learning culture and energizing culture that um, allows people to give um, incentives to each other when they've done a fantastic job. Um, those individuals in the company that if you were to do that hub and spoke, most people go to for whatever you know a specific item that they need in a specific tech stack and being able to reward them and then we talk about those individuals that have been highlighted wherever they are in the world so just a few thoughts on how to keep people incentivized and keep the team um, structure alive i love that chef idea i think we might pinch that uh, over here as well that's a great one we've, we've been doing some fitness related uh, ones so we've had uh, Group-led yoga has been very popular. Another area has been uh, competition. So we've had global teams competing and it's whoever can get the most average number of fitness minutes in. And so people are doing different fitness, whatever suits them, and then they combine it at the end of the week and see who's ahead. So a little bit of friendly competition while getting people outside of their, their house has been uh, very popular too. Awesome. Dave? Oh, golly, you know, we've had uh, early on, we had a few social Zoom calls. Um, and, you know, that's great. People uh, are balancing their time between uh, work and kids when they're working at home, um, family time. And I think that was, was a good idea. Somewhat, uh, uh, you know, locked up people after hours, which wasn't really a good thing. Um, so, you know, we've kind of put a little bit of a recognition component into kind of our monthly State of the Union meetings where we'll recognize somebody um, for something they've done. And so I think just keeping people engaged and, and letting them know that, hey, look, you know, you are making a difference and you're, you're productive and, uh, you know, having a big impact, even though you may not feel that way because they're not physically present in the office. I think that's important. Excellent. Thanks. You know, Craig, you've had a recent anniversary and you had an interesting uh, exercise or game that you all celebrated around. Do you want to kind of share that with the group or maybe you already touched on it? Uh, no, I'd, I'd love to share. So we, we've got a culture where we like to get together in person in the countries where we work. So we think we did this like 11 countries last year and oftentimes we get together in Vegas for bigger groups. But we celebrate our 15 year anniversary under, under COVID environments. And so we needed something to kind of bring everyone together. So the answer to that was a live party that ran for 15 hours and we use Microsoft Teams to do this. We started in Australia with kind of pop culture, rotated through Japan and Korea, big party in India. There was ceremonial dancing and singing. Uh, then we, a bit more cultural uh, in, in Israel, there was an important holiday there. Celebratory drinks in EMEA, uh, discussions about where the best beer comes from, not an EMEA, just a heads up. And then we went across to Latin America, dancing, local food, uh, learning about the different states in Brazil. And then we wrapped up in the US for the final few hours. So uh, totally unique experience, never seen anything before like, never seen so many people on the team score before. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, something very memorable. And it's about making those memories, right? That uh, will last a lifetime. I love it. What a great, and Craig, you're an amazing storyteller. It just highlights, you know, being a great leader, you have to be able to communicate, right, effectively. And you have to be able to really work in your communication. And being a great storyteller is core and key to being to a successful career, right, Don? 
And uh, when you think about, is it the best time ever to be in tech? I mean, right now, I mean, you guys have been at, some of us, 30 plus years, 35 years. Don? Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's that time where all of a sudden tech is in the front, right? Sometimes tech's always in the back. You know it's driving companies, but you don't always get that opportunity to bring your team in the front room. And now your team is in the front room. And so getting everybody excited about that, engaged about that, and getting them to realize, especially some of the younger team members to understand that this doesn't come along in IT careers all the time. Take advantage of it. Take center stage. Show how we can add the innovation and kind of keep that excitement going. Right. Perfect. Well said. Dave, you want to comment? Oh, I think you hit, hit the nail on the head. Great. Paul, best time ever? Yeah, no, it, 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 you know, so it's the usual, you know, it's the best of time, worst of times. So, uh, you know, it's definitely, there's so many good things going on right now that uh, can lead to uh, growth within your team and you personally. So what you got to do is identify those opportunities and help to build a strategy with the organization that uh, not only helps the organization where you can provide value, but also gives you the growth opportunities. And I think one of the big areas, uh, I know we've been talking a lot about remote work and that, but uh, I, I would not forget about automation. I mean, the appetite right now for automation within companies is so much more. Uh, they're looking for ways that uh, they can, uh, you know, improve the operations and also reduce the amount of uh, uh, work that they have to rely on physical labor and hands-on for services. So, so many opportunities in that area. And, uh, you know, I, I know for myself, We've been pushing it a lot and working with the company. And again, they're much more receptive now than they were before the pandemic. So again, a lot of opportunities. Thanks, Paul. Craig, final comment? Yeah, I totally agree, Hunter. I mean, it's a great opportunity, I think, for everyone. Obviously, we've, our hearts go out to, to so many impacted, but I think that this has been a great opportunity for IT to shine and for true leaders to come forth and make a huge impact. So very competitive landscape out there. Let's leave it better than we found it. Awesome, great job. Final word? I think uh, just echoing a lot of the comments that have already been said, this is a fun time to be in technology. Um, I think we've built, we built a lot of credibility worldwide um, and continue to be a critical part of the business's success. And now we have to take all of that built up um, goodwill <laughs> and continue to turn it into um, actionable and productivity driven outcomes into the future years. So excited to be a part of the function. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Craig, Paul. Great job. Uh, David and Don, great job. Guys, this, this is a wrap, but this is the best panel we've had all year in the pandemic. Great job by everyone. Stay with us. We have couple another hour of programming and the, the recognition program at the very end but thanks again uh, next up we have ken pennington ken's going to lead the panel on powering digital innovation through diversity ken great to see you my friend well good to see you hunter thanks for having me today awesome great to catch up why don't you take it away uh introduce your panelists and uh i'll be back when uh, to, when we transition all right sounds good thank you very much appreciate it uh, so Ken Pittington, uh, Vice President CIO with U.S. Silica. I've got a great group of folks here today, as I see everybody popping in on screen, to, uh, to talk today about powering digital innovation through diversity. So let me just set the stage and I'll get all my panelists introduced and, and we'll have a, have a great conversation. So there's been numerous research studies out there that reveal the companies that are most successful in innovating uh, really draw upon strategies that, that, that develop the insights from a diverse team uh, who share different perspectives for problem solving and, and how do they tackle those, those opportunities. And I've really found that that aligns well with my own experiences and, and strategies I've had at many different organizations that I've been privileged to be a part of. So I'm excited today as we hear from this great group of uh, Houston area business technology leaders and how they best foster uh, diversity inclusion across the company and find effective ways to leverage the viewpoints of those diverse teams to drive innovation uh, and really gain a competitive edge. And I'm, I'm privileged to be joined today by Myra Davis from Texas Children's, uh, Alan Wersher from Toshiba, Jesse Carrillo at Heinz, and, and Vikas uh, Parika from, from Lion Del Vicel. I apologize if I messed up your name there. We'll, uh, we'll let, you, let you reintroduce yourself on that. 
So why don't we go through and give, each of you give a brief introduction and, and give me an opening statement about your thoughts on powering digital innovation uh, through diversity. And Myra, I'd like to start with you. Hello, thank you for having me. And um, I am the Chief Information Innovation Officer here with Texas Children's. Um, I've been here 18 years um, and on the technology journey for quite some time. Um, in terms of the question you asked, um, I think really uh, diversity really means, in my opinion, around the innovation team, the diversity of thought um, that brings to the table and skill sets um, and individuals. So everybody around the table should not look the same, be in the same title. Um, there should be a variation of roles um, that we typically exercise there because it's important to bring different perspectives around problems that are presented that are needed to be solved. Um, and so we make it a point to ensure that the diversity of the table is well represented. Very good, thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, Vikas, how about you? Would, uh, would you give a brief introduction and give us your opening thoughts about powering digital innovation through diversity? Thanks, Ken. Um, so um, I'm uh, Vikas Parik. Uh, I'm uh, the chief architect at Lionel Vassell. I started uh, uh, late last year. And prior to that, I was a uh, couple of years at EY in their MA practice and 15 years at GE in various roles. So um, the, the, the way I think about this, uh, Ken, is uh, diversity definitely everything everything that Maida said you know that's that's a huge focus absolutely right uh, I would I would like to introduce you know something around building an innovative mindset okay so what what does that mean simply said innovative mindset is the willingness and ability of employees to innovate all right so how do you how do you tackle that the ability of employees to innovate is, is through recruiting, hiring the right folks, right diverse folks, right? Have a global team. The willingness aspect of it, that is where I focus on the inclusive part of it, right? What, well, and, and, and the, way, the, way, the way to think about this, and, and I'll give you some interesting facts. Um, we have seen, you know, I've, I've read some research around a diverse team and an inclusive team has an 11 factor, multiplier factor, innovative mindset over a diverse team, but a non-equal team. So you can, you can, you can imagine the power of equality that, that, that it creates and, and how it helps accelerate the innovative mindset. Right, and the way I think about this is in, in, in three angles, right? How do you think about it? Are you empowering your team, right? Is there a trust created within your team? The second is, is the, is the leadership bold enough? And when I say bold enough, you know, are you, are you encouraging the, the culture around risk-taking and, and failure? It's okay to fail. And third is, you know, is, is the leadership action-oriented and inspiring employees both from an internal external perspective to live their core values, right? So this is how I think about, you know, the whole innovative mindset and how, how, how organizations are gonna leapfrog each other, you know, with everything equal, you know, in, in, in driving innovation. Very good, thank you. I love how you bring that. It's not just about diversity, it's about the inclusion to it as, as well. I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. Alan, how about you? Why don't you give you an introduction and give us your opening thoughts on our, on our topic today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Alan Wisher, CIO at Toshiba International Corporation. Uh, Toshiba does a lot of things. We mostly focus manufacturing in the States and Houston, Texas on industrial systems such as motors, drives, UPS devices and the like, but we sell a lot of stuff. Um, your question related to powering digital through diversity. Um, you know, I think in IT and in digital, a lot of times the, the notion can be that one size fits all. And that's not just the case. It, it isn't uh, ever that way. And I think that's something that companies are learning faster now than ever. Uh, and I think that's where diversity really makes 
a, uh, a mark on successful companies. <laughs> Because when it even comes to things like it, as digital, where it may look like a platform can handle any any country, the reality is it can't. It has to perform something. Something needs to be different to really serve the customer base in other countries. And that's where having a diverse team matters. Does it work in this country? Yes. Why wouldn't it work in that country? This is why. So that's why diversity matters in the digital space. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's not a one size fits all. We're all different organizations. Uh, different industries, different leadership, um, different needs. I think it's, it's really important that we approach it that way uh, around here, around this as, this topic as well. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Jesse, how about you introduce yourself and give us your opening thoughts on powering digital innovation through diversity? Hey, thanks, Ken. Great, great hanging out with you guys again. Um, <clears throat> Jesse Carrillo, I'm the SVP and Chief Information Officer with Heinz uh, Commercial Real Estate. Uh, I would say the, the cool thing about being the last one, I can just say all the above. It's so much easier to say that way. But uh, no, I think absolutely everything that everybody said to me, it, it's what I like to when I speak to my team about this is, is even though I'm a leader in the, the CIO, I don't always have all the answers and I, I don't I'm not always right. And so I love the idea of having diverse thoughts, diverse folks, um, you know, being able to challenge, ask questions, give them a platform where they all feel like they have an equal voice. I think because another said that, you know, they're empowering them and, and including and so I think that's the way I look at it is is we need that input to make it stronger and then that's why I think we need to surround ourselves with diversity as we work on these digital, digital projects and I agree with Alan uh, it's a great analogy um, you know, so we, you know it's easy to say well we'll just implement one big technology one big ERP and then we're done we can handle everything but the truth is we all know in our careers that's not the answer so diversity and, and technology is important as well very good all right thank you so it's so much of the topic of this year this whole uh lot on this, the, the HMG Summit here today is focusing on diversity. We're hearing a lot about it in the news. I'm curious uh, from our audience, we'll pop up a poll here. Does your organization have a formal diversity inclusion program sponsored by the CEO? So Melissa, you could, could put that poll up. Uh, that would be fantastic. There we go. So curious to see, uh, see everybody's poll. Let's see what their, their answers are here um, as to, to how you're dealing with this at your, your organization. Just give it a minute and then uh, let's see, we can uh, share the results. So we'll see where everybody's at. Okay, let's so we share that. There we go. So yeah, so just over half of the companies uh, do uh, and others are, are, are really thinking about we're discussing it but don't have anything formally uh, set in place yet. So uh, it's, it's pretty common as I'm finding here uh, today that companies are really getting into the groove of starting to think about this and, and plan more for it, make it more formality. I mean, I know a lot from my own experience, it happened in formal, just my own mindset as, as a leader. And I like it with the group that we have here today, I'm curious, what have you been able to do to foster, how have you fostered diversity and inclusion within your department and across your company, whether it's at your current organization or somewhere you've been before. And again, Myra, I'll start with, start with you. So given that I've been here for a long time, I'll just speak <laughs> to my tenure here because I, I would age myself if I went beyond Texas Children's. Um, you know, I would say that um, we've had lots of discussions around um, the need or whether or not we should have diversity inclusion individual as a role, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say we're not going that route um, because this is not a one person job. Um, I think that's a false representation of the role. Um, I think the way in which we're doing it is really fostering and encouraging and sort of an amplified and amplified unity across the organization um, to understand what it means to be inclusive. Um, and diverse. And I think I like what um, Vika said earlier, that it's 11x. When you put the right, there's a lot of richness to having diversity of thought, opinion, mindset, actions at the table. An organization can move ex just expeditiously. It can move so fast. And so I, we are focused on ensuring that we are amplifying unity across the organization. Um, so that it's diverse and it's also inclusive of everyone from the, the front lines to an executive, it doesn't matter. So 
um, I'm really proud of how we are representing it and choosing to do it and not, it may warrant a smaller committee just as an oversight, but the, the movement is across all 17,000 of our workforce, which is a lot more exciting um, to ensure that we're being truly inclusive. Very good. I love amplifying unity. I think that's a, it's a great statement, one we can all take, take away from today's, uh, today's conversation. Vikas, how about you? What have you been doing to foster diversity and inclusion uh, in your department and across the organization? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll double click into my initial thoughts uh, and I'll, I see it around six pillars and I'll give you an example of each. One is purpose, right? Is the entire organization aligned towards a, a purpose? That is very important. That has to come top down. It has to start from the CEO and the leadership team. Second is autonomy. Do you, are you providing the right empowerment to the team and, and speak up, right? And in various forums, right? And, and in, an, in, a, in a culture like ours, which is a very hierarchical top-down culture, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. So we have to call out on people, right? We have to, we have to tell them one on, in one-on-one -on -one setting that, hey, you have a lot of ideas, let's, let's bring them up. It's okay to speak up. Third is, are we providing as leaders, are we providing the right resources, right? And, and resources by what I mean by not just internal, but external, right? Today, we have a huge partner ecosystem that we should be able to leverage, right? What we are doing at Lyondell is, you know, we, we have a big partnership with Microsoft. We have a big partnership with, uh, uh, you know, service now. We have a big partnership with others. So what, what we are trying to do is leverage their education, leverage their training program for, for, our, for our employees. Uh, are we inspiring the employees, right? This, is, this goes along with the purpose, but, you know, in, inspiration. Is there, is there inspiration both coming externally? Are the employees collaborating? Are we providing the right mindset? Are we providing the right environment to collaborate both from a technology perspective, but more culturally, right? And the sixth thing would be, are we, are we allowing experimentation, right? And, 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 and I'll give you a small example. Uh, Kathy was on, on a panel earlier. Uh, when she became the CIO, she made a statement out there. It's a very small thing, but if you think about it, hey, it's okay to fail on your certification exam. We will repay for your second attempt, right? That itself is, is, a, is you know, in, in an employee mindset, it's like, okay, you know, it's okay to fail because my leader is encouraging me to learn and train. So those those are those are the six pillars how you know how we think about um, uh, driving innovation and, and inclusiveness at at Lyondale. No, it's great. Has it been harder with the pandemic and so many people working remote to really foster the inclusion in the mindset? I think I think with our culture it has been, uh, but then we have found innovative ways of 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 making that happen as well. Right, so there's, there's communication, communication, communication is the key. Uh, because of our culture being, being very hierarchical, you know, speaking less from a leadership perspective and listening more is, is a key. Probing, right? Uh, we talked about the video culture. Uh, we encourage that a lot as well. So, uh, and then, and then, you know, we, well, 50 to 60% of our, of our employee base is still in the manufacturing plant, right? So, so wherever possible, we you know, we get on a video call with those guys as well and, and foster collaboration. So yeah, various ways of doing it. And, and we have heard from other panelists around that. Thank you. Um, so Alan, how, how have you leveraged the viewpoints of your diverse teams to drive this innovation? So uh, leveraging is just listening. I think I'll, I'll uh, you know, Vikas had a couple good points there in terms of inspiration and education. Uh, you know, it's just listening to the teams and making sure that uh, we're promoting the right people within organizations, uh, providing the right aspects of support for people because different people need different types of support so oftentimes I think 
we sometimes may pass up someone who may be a very good fit just because we don't understand what their challenges are. So we need to listen to their challenges so that we understand how we can promote their success. Uh, and so that is how, you know, we are promoting people within in maybe some different ways than what we've done in the past, which creates more diversity in thinking, which again helps us on our digital roadmap uh, as it gives us more insight into what different, you know, what different countries think about what it is that Toshiba is doing. I like that listening and understanding. It's really that's that's great. Good advice, uh, Jesse. A little different question for you around this. What 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 have been your challenges that you've experienced? in fostering diversity and inclusion at Heinz and what have you done to overcome them? Well, I mean, I think the challenge is, is like has been discussed, you know, being a global firm, uh, you know, there are different perspectives, different different ways to to kind of listen to your employees and, and empower your, your employees. I, I'd say I'm going to look at it in two ways. One is pre-COVID and, and post-COVID. Uh, you know, at Heinz, we've always had a very, you know, kind of top-down, you know, BE, and I, you know, programs, and, and we actually have a head of the and I and, and a team. And so over the years, we've always focused on that heavily. And I know me personally, I focused on it heavily with some of the, um, you know, charitable organizations I belong with. And so we've, we've always fostered that. I think it was amped up significantly with COVID and then all the, the issues and challenges that happened in the U.S. You know, we can go into different details around all the uh, things that are happening there, but I think it really amped up uh, the really the need to really bring this to the forefront. Uh, so, so I think, I think that's kind of what we're structured here. I would say for, for me as a department, again, it, it's, it's, it's focusing on, you know, empowering and, and promoting and helping our current team members, but just as importantly, the succession in the pipeline. I think, again, I, I mentioned it briefly, I belong to a lot of organizations. I know Myra and Alan, and because you belong to organizations, I know I've persisted with, with some with Myra. You know, being able to go back and, and, and hopefully serve as a little bit of a role model and, and encourage, uh, you know, the, the younger generation to get into our fields, to really look at technology a little differently. It's, it's not just playing on a device. Maybe it could be if you work for a gaming company. But, but again, getting people excited about IT again. I think, I think you know, we, we've gone through ebb and flows around IT and what is the CIO role and, and what do I want to do in technology. And, and I think, um, you know, I think someone said in a previous panel, or but I think this situation, the COVID situation really has brought the IT leadership and our IT teams to the forefront around the importance of what we do. We always said we, we were doing good stuff and preparing the company for the worst case scenarios. Well, we've seen one of the worst case scenarios and, and we've done it. And so how do I then turn that into messaging back to the next generation of leaders, both that I have currently or, or bringing up the pipeline and making sure that it's a diverse set of people coming in, you know, being interested in the technology. So again, I think part of it is Heinz is structured that way, and we've got great programs in place and continue to communicate and educate. But me personally, just being able to reach out to the communities and encourage more interest in, in technology and IT, I think is the way I'm doing it. Very good. Yeah, I know how much how involved you are in all those programs externally. And it's a great point about we can't we have to think about our current teams and ensuring that they're feeling included and in understanding what we're doing today and also building for tomorrow. So very, very good. We're getting close to our ending time. So I wanted to give everybody like a quick one word or two word piece of advice uh, you'd love to give to the audience on this on this topic and like, you know, what should we do? And I guess I'll start with you. Just one, two word, quick piece of advice to close things out. I would I would say focus on on your team and 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 fostering inclusiveness and building that trust and empower empower the team and, and get out of their way. Okay, great. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, I'd say uh, we have to truly focus and have a better focus on diversity going forward. It's a key, it's a key metric for how we're successful in the United States in general. And I think these other countries, because we're all going virtual, are going to figure this out and they're going to start becoming more virtually diverse than we've ever seen them. Competitive advantage, take advantage of it while we're here in the U.S. and get diversity on your teams. All right. Sounds good. Jesse, quick uh, closing statement, closing couple words. Yeah, don't stop the conversation. I mean, I love these kind of panels because it keeps the conversation going. This conversation should never stop. And uh, hopefully in our careers, at some point we could say it, it's done, but you know, reality is it, sh it should never stop and it keeps going. So don't stop. Great, thank you. And Myra, final closing uh, st quick statement. Oop, you're still on mute. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I would say all of the above and 
more than anything, I think during times like this, um, I would encourage everyone to be open. And uh, sometimes that word diversity just drives to an immediate um, thought. I would, I would really challenge people to say, let's value differences. How do we be open to valuing differences? Very good, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for participating today. Greatly appreciate it. I think it's really good that we think about building diverse teams as just part of the equation. We've also got to support an environment and culture of inclusion, really making people feel part of the team in order for the company themselves to be successful. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Hunter, thank you for having us. Hey, Ken, great to see you. Great job. Myra, Jet, Bikus, and uh, Alan, awesome. Really appreciate you. your engagement. Uh, thank you so much and stay well. Thank you. Hopefully you can stay with us to the end of the program. Hey, next up, we have a uh, crisis in career, preparing for the next opportunity. Uh, this is the all-star panel. Uh, and we've got Tim Crawford coming in from uh, Southern California, and Tony Lang from Northern California, Jamie Cummings from Dallas, Texas, and take it away, guys. Yes, and we have uh, one more coming in, Steve Kendrick, <laughs> who's also coming in from Dallas. So uh, thanks for having us. Um, and thanks for everyone who's, who's watching the program. Uh, so, you know, crisis in and career. It's not your career in crisis, but how to manage your career during a crisis. And so we've assembled this panel to really kind of dig into what's different, what's changed. Um, technology is now in the forefront of every company uh, as if it shouldn't have been or wasn't in the past. And so this panel is really intended to talk about what's changed, what executive recruiters are looking for, what their clients are looking for. And so let's just kind of jump right into it. So first on the list, Jamie Cummings, Senior Client Partner with Corn Ferry. Jamie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tim. Great to connect with you. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. And second up is Steve Kendrick, who is President of Kerr Partners. Steve, welcome to the program. Good afternoon, Tim. Great to be here and uh, look forward to participating. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. And last but not least, Mr. Tony Lang, Managing Director of Diversified Search. Tony, welcome. Thank you, Tim, and great to see Jamie and Steve again. I love this conversation, thank you. You know, quite often we talk about um, just how we can manage our careers as IT leaders. What is the process we go through? What are some of the traits that we should exhibit? Um, but things have tr changed pretty demonstrably. You know, Tony, I'm going to start with you and just kind of ask, what has changed? What are clients looking for? What are you looking for in candidates in this new realm within COVID-19? Well, I, we've heard it from other panelists already. The world changed. Digital became important. But not only that, you know, I, I talk about heroes and villains. And uh, heroes are the people who did well. Their budgets are being protected, accelerated. They're recruiting. The villains are out the door and we are replacing them. So what has changed? People are looking for executives who are at the table, who can be part of the conversation, who are creating value at the top line and the bottom line. And really, your time has come if you're a CIO. If not already, it's pushed right into the front of everybody's agenda. And you better start thinking like a CEO because you need to be thinking holistically about the impact on the entire business because corporate strategies are changing, IT strategies are changing, people's strategies are changing. We've just heard about it in other panels, but I won't talk more. I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie and Steve who I'm sure will augment what I've just said. Jamie, Steve? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'll mention that uh, may not be obvious is that I think, uh, in fact, here at Corn Ferry, some of you have made, uh, maybe have heard Brandon Johnson be a guest on one of these panels, but he joined the firm, I believe it was January, February. What's interesting is he was thrust into a corporate leadership position that, quite frankly, I think most people would say really didn't have anything specifically to do with technology and had to do with just overall corporate leadership. So he has been one of the main uh, he's really the main communicators of our updates with respect to COVID response. So business continuity, disaster recovery. So I would say what we're seeing is uh, technology leaders are becoming more than just quote unquote technology or IT leaders. And so my advice would be for you as a technology leader, um, really strive to be seen as a leader and technology is just something you happen to be good at. Uh, so that's one of the most 
I think prominent themes I've seen, not just with our CIO, but other CIOs that have been talking about in the market, they've been thrust to the forefront of playing a significant role in leadership in their companies in this environment. Steve? Yeah, whether uh, clients are saying this or not, um, what's clear over the last seven to eight months where clearly we've had this uh, you know, unparalleled experience like none of us have seen, not only in our careers, but let's face it, in our lives. So whether clients are saying it today or not, pace and agility are absolutely paramount. Mm -hmm. uh, your ability to, uh, to be agile, to, to quite frankly, elevate uh, the conversation uh, with, with your business whether you're the CIO or you're running a major project or program, how can you as the IT leader elevate IT or your particular uh, voice in the conversation around you know, problem resolution and helping the business achieve you know, their tactical and strategic growth plans. And um, if you can do that, then you'll, you'll, be, you'll be demonstrating value that, that the business will certainly understand and appreciate. Yep. And Tim, let me add one other point. I just sure. think the complexity level has dramatically in, you know, increased. Not only do the leaders now have to move quickly and be you know, great communicators, as, as Steve and Jamie have said, but there's the social dynamic, which we just heard about in the last panel, which has elevated the complexity. And frankly, the old leadership agenda, the top-down model of, I'm in charge, I'm going to tell you what to do, the timing and the, and the speed and the complexity just don't allow that anymore. And so there's a new leadership agenda, which is about empowering and being open and vulnerable, that if you don't have that capability, how do you develop and empower and unleash the team members that you have to react with the speed and the agility that's required? So the leadership agenda has shifted pretty dramatically as well. You know, you talked a little bit, Tony, about how the CIO or, or head of IT, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the person with the CIO title, but how they think like that of the CEO. And that's a very different mindset. Are you, are, and this is really kind of more of a question for each of the three of you, you know, as we think about changes in our company, you know, how we engage with customers, customer experience, customer engagement is at the forefront. Our customers are changing. But at the same time, our business operations, the back end pieces are changing too. How is that coming up in, in your conversations with clients and what you're looking for uh, in candidates? Shall I start again? So sure. we, we get to look for, for kind of digital officers or CIOs or other people. And what we often have to do to our clients is explain the chief digital officer isn't the person just doing the website. Really, digital is now end to end from if you're a manufacturing company to R&D manufacturing, if you're healthcare, it's stretching all the way through the business. And really, the purpose of every business is to find and keep customers. And if the CIO is not thinking like that, then he or she isn't out there generating value to find those customers and keep those customers and delight those customers. And they need to think end to end. That's my beginning two cents. And that gets back to what was said earlier about you have to think about the top end and the bottom end to it, right? Both sides of that equation. Steve, I wanna get your thoughts on this too. Well, what we've seen is whether we're recruiting a CIO or whether we're recruiting a significant IT leader is typically organizations who are trying to rewire their business to take advantage of all of these digital moving parts. And you know, digital is broad, it's deep, it's, it's changing the way you do business, either because you're being forced to do that competitively, or you might even be being forced to do that from a customer perspective because you know, they're, they're looking to be more digitally enabled. Uh, they want to basically interact with you often the way that you know, they interact with, with, with Apple or iPhone or whomever. Um, but in this situation where, you know, you, you are, you've got that opportunity to uh, set the stage and to um, help craft, quite frankly, some of the difficult questions that, you know, quite frankly, the business may not be asking of themselves. And therein lies the opportunity. Again, it's not mm -hmm. showing up to the, to the party with an IT hammer looking for nails, but how can you help the business think through challenges and opportunities uh, that, that certainly they should be pursuing that, that may result in opportunities to increase customer experience, increase, uh, you know, 
greater connectivity with the customer base that they have, as well as things like certainly enabling uh, the Salesforce organization for top line, driving top line. Yeah. So, you know, as you think about that continuum, you talked about flexibility, you talk about speed, you know, your business has to be more flexible now than ever. You have to be able to be more agile than ever. But at the same time, from a technology standpoint, it's getting incredibly more complicated. We think about data, we think about edge to cloud. How does all of this kind of get rationalized into conversations with, between IT leaders and business leaders? Jamie, let me start with you and kind of get your thoughts on what are some of those big themes and how those conversations are trending, especially in this, this age of COVID? Well, I think it's uh, very relevant. We actually have a, a search right now that we just kicked off for, a, once again, it's a transformational CIO. It's a bit of an overused phrase, but one of the big themes was around decision-making. How do we use data to accelerate decision-making to prioritize things, whether it's product development, pricing, to uh, in, increase the accuracy and reduce errors? And that, you know, that, just to, that sounds great conceptually, but to actually make that happen and determine what technology and really at the day the process and people or what would get in the way, <laughs> quite frankly, to, to make that happen. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the biggest issues is once you get a few points on the board, might you be oversubscribed and how do you prioritize? A lot of great ideas, but which ones are most important? What's return on investment? In order to do that, to understand the decision making, the decisions that different stakeholders are making and how you prioritize and enable them, you absolutely have to have a substantial amount of business acumen and ability to build relationships uh, and to influence throughout the organization. Those are been year for years consistently skill sets we're looking for, but I think the current environment and that trying to enhance decision making and using data to do that is what I see as one of the areas where they have to you have to be able to prioritize and convince others others as to why you are doing that. No, that's great, Tony. Yeah, and, and Tim, let me build on that. And Jamie is 100% correct. Uh, data is really, really important and decision speeds are important. But there's an openness to the world. You know, we've gone from, to use an analogy, from a castle and moat to kind of a platform ecosystem world. So we had companies that built these big moats and high walls and try to fight off everybody. And that has shifted into this open world where you either are the main platform or you're a key player within an ecosystem and you need to be open. You need to ingest a lot of data. Yeah, you need to be able to connect with other people in a much more effective way. And that is another very broad theme that I believe CIOs need to be able to communicate into their businesses. So yes, you're open, you're in ingesting lots and lots of data and making informed decisions, but you got to be in the game. you got to be playing a part. Steve, I want to get your thoughts too on, on themes that you're seeing. Well, uh, as a continuation of what's already been cited here, I would say that, uh, again, the last seven to eight months, everything's been pronounced, right? Everything's been pronounced just in terms of your ability to be at the table uh, be engaging with the business, be thoughtful with your questions. Again, it has nothing to do with, you know, no offense, but IT, but it's, it's go, it goes back to what Jamie was citing. You know, what is your curiosity, your, 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 ac, your business acumen around the curiosity of something you're trying to drill down to at root cause that, that is causing a sense of pain or problem or maybe even opportunity, again, uh, inside the business. So clearly, uh, there, it, it, every, you know, it's, a, it's a pronounced opportunity for, again, you to show up, um, become a better storyteller, but, but do that in a way that's authentic, that allows you to demonstrate and share some stories, some lessons learned, that, you know, at the same time, uh, demonstrate some of your own humility uh, and what your own journey has been. People, that resonates with people, that resonates with your business partners, it resonates with your team, and, and people get it, but, but keep it simple. So it's okay that I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. So guys, we, we only have um, just a quick minute here. So maybe let's just do a quick round before I turn it back over to Hunter. One quick takeaway. Steve, let me start with you. One quick takeaway. The one quick take takeaway is whether you're the CIO or whether you're an aspiring CIO or even significant number two, it may sound uh, it may sound trite, but just this notion of 
uh, is your resume updated, right? Have you taken the opportunity, and if you haven't, get this on your A-list to do. You know, get your resume updated to highlight those lessons learned, those opportunities that you've had the where you've had the opportunity to demonstrate leadership over the last seven to eight months. That's great, Jamie. One quick takeaway. Okay, if if you're not if you're comfortable, then you're probably not developing and learning. Uh, you should be constantly pressing yourself and your team to adapt and be agile because it's required in this environment. So push yourself and your team beyond your comfort zone. That's great, Tony. This has been a crisis. You must have learned. Do all the things that the others have said, but also look internally and figure out where have I grown personally? Because life is often about your personal journey. To be a better leader, you've got to be a better person. You know, there, there are a lot of takeaways from this conversation. I think there's a lot we can learn. I know there's a lot I've learned, uh, not just from this conversation, but the past 10 months. And so with that, let's close out this panel. And Hunter, back to you. Hey, Tim, thanks so much. Uh, guys, Jamie, Steve, Tony, awesome job. Tim, you nailed it. Thank you. You're a great friend, great partner. Thank you. Hey, next up, we have Zero Trust, Cliff Triplett. Cliff, welcome to the program. Stuff started. My video okay. is not starting. Not, video's not starting? I'm trying. Okay. There you go. Be on. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. Appreciate it. Take it away. So um, this panel is about zero trust. And I think we all just finished, you know, over the last decade, this concept of the cloud. And so today we're going to talk about what I think is a new trend that I'm seeing across the globe in organizations and governments. And we're going to also build on that concept of diversity. I think it was earlier, you know, in this, um, this session. But the diversity, of, we're going to really focus on the diversity of perspective. So I'm going to give a little insight on a government perspective. I have some great panelists, uh, Janie Beach, and we'll have her introduce herself in just a second. And she's going to come from a perspective of a pretty significant corporate perspective. And then we have Monty Node uh, also on the panel, and he's going to come from the perspective of a new startup approach. So this is about, you know, from the biggest animal, the U.S. government, to a new startup and someone in the middle. And what is zero trust and what impact is it having on those kind of organizations? So before I go any further, I just want a quick introduction of my uh, two panelists. And, uh, and then I'm gonna kind of set the stage a little bit about what is this thing zero trust we're talking about. So Monty, we'll start with you to introduce yourself. You bet, hi Cliff. Uh, and it's good to see you too, Janie. Uh, my name is Monty Canode. I am a former government myself. I am a retired Air Force and had an, uh, Absolute wonderful time going around the globe and getting to do good things in cyber out there. Grew up in special operations and tactical calm, and then got to pivot over to both defensive and offensive operations. And uh, I got to meet my CEO about five years ago when I was the deputy CIO at U.S. Transportation Command responsible for global logistics and transportation across all the services. And uh, that was a heck of an experience. And now in this startup, we are giving the attackers, attacker's perspective uh, with Horizon 3i, uh, 3 AI, where we are very much a data company, but focused on cybersecurity up front and helping some people out. And Janie? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janie Beach. I am the uh, Director of IT Application Development and QA Production at Wood Forest National Bank right now. I also actually have, uh, in my history, a Department of Defense background. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is because in the, the, in the area of uh, zero trust and privacy and security and so forth, um, the, the two are very similar in that banking is a highly regulated industry. Um, obviously, you want your bank to protect you uh, from any kind of a breach. Um, and so it's, it's very highly regulated, very similar to the Department of Defense. And um, I'm honored to be on the panel today to be able to share a little bit more about zero trust and uh, where we think that the uh, whole information security um, um, profile is headed as we move into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. So what I wanna do begin with is I'm gonna show just two slides and they're just to kind of set the stage. Cause what I have found in my conversation about zero trust is there's not a common view of what it is. At this level, there's probably some harmony as to what zero trust means. And the big difference here is 
this continuous testing of the authentication and authorization of, of the entities in what they're trying to do. And so this is one definition. I don't think you can find a one that's universal, but the reason I chose this one from Stealth Path is this is the one I'm currently using with uh, US Army Cyber Command and US Cyber Command. So, you know, you gotta have something. So I pulled this one, they seem to be going with it. I think they're kind of tip of the spear on zero trust. I think, you know, my panelists all have some defense background and they tend to lead in some of these security fronts. And so I'm using this definition. Let's go to the next slide. But then the next thing is, I think we all remember this term cloud and everything was cloud. Everybody sold cloud and you're going, it seems like same old, same old. I don't really see it other than a marketing term. And I think zero trust is right in that game. I don't think it's at the end state where I think today we all probably feel we know what cloud is, but I don't think we all know what zero trust is. And when I was working with uh, the Department of Defense, this is exactly their problem. They said, we hear a lot about the zero trust thing, but what is it? How do we go out and assess what it is and where are we on the journey? And I think some of my panelists are gonna talk about what part of zero trust do I need to do for my situation? Because you know, one thing is running a nuclear reactor, let's say, in a submarine, well, we really wanna make sure that's super protected or a nuclear weapon. But on the other hand, uh, we probably don't need that same protection um, for our refrigerator. Okay, we still like to have it protected, but not at the same level. So how do we talk about it? How do we think about it? How does it fit in our strategy? And, and I wanna pick up two things that uh, Tony Lang just talked about in the last panel. He says, this is really becoming an open world. And I totally concur, and I think that's one of the things that's driving this whole zero trust concept. This hard perimeter is gone. I mean, we are talking about connecting to the IoT world. People are working from home, and now they're talking about we have to integrate with their whole home ecosystem. Uh, we have lost control over most of the devices. Uh, it, it's just gone crazy. So the complexity has gone way up, so we have to start thinking differently. And Tony also talked about we're now getting to the point where we really have to talk about connecting people um, to the information. Um, one of the big uh, things that's driving this in the Department of Defense, and I'll give some credit to General Cropper, who is a CIO of the Army, he put out an executive order and said, basically, what I need to do is provide the most relevant information as near real time to the modern warfighter. And even though that's a defense uh, operation, I think that fits business too. I think that's what we're all striving to do. And that's the new journey we're on. And I think just COVID again, as many of the panelists talked about, is really pushes us in that direction. So how did this you know, capability model come to existence? The Army and Defense Department has been doing stuff like this for a long time. Nuclear command and troll, Tempest. So a lot of it is kind of the same old stuff. But now it's gone beyond our nuclear command and control because our whole world now things become important. Everything's important. Janie talked about um, banking and finance. Yeah, we better start worrying about it. Now people are starting to do transactions from their phone. I mean, you can do your whole banking from your phone today and how much control does Janie really have on her phone? Okay, that's the kind of thing we have to be concerned. So I'll drop the um, slides now and get back to really talking about the panel. So. Um, let me talk about the problem the Army's facing. So one, I talked to you about the mission from the Lieutenant General, uh, the CIO of the Army, what he's trying to do for the warfighter, but I'll put that out more as a vision. But they have some real practical challenges today. And one of the practical challenges is they want to take advantage of things like Office 365. It's a cloud environment. Uh, they want to consolidate and simplify their data centers, just like corporate America's do. They want to do a lot of that stuff because this isn't really core warfighting mission, but a reality in, uh, of, of, of the mission as the Department of Defense. So how do we do it? So now the challenge they're facing is what is zero trust? And I'm going to talk about it in three layers. One, what we control. So such as the corporate environment or whatever device you have. What should be at a shared service? And what should we expect of our cloud providers? And 
when we look at it, we have to look at the zero trust capabilities and which do we expect of each? And then based on our level of risk, how many of these capabilities do we need? Now, that's where they started. And then that's kind of infrastructure perspective, but there's also a perspective of application. We're gonna have Janie talk about that a bit more. And the, and the big concept there in the military that's headstrong going on everywhere is just DevSecOps, okay? And so it's development, security, and operations. And how does zero trust play there? Because before it was, yes, security, but what exactly is the flavor of security and DevSecOps? Okay, it tends to be more reusable software components, but not really a framework. And so the introduction of zero trust is becoming to happen there. And so I'm going to pause there. That's kind of the big government story. And uh, now I want to talk about go to Janie and say, Janie, at corporate America, um, you're doing the DevSecOps. You see the value. You said you're banking. How is zero trust? Um, do you think going to impact your approach to DevSecOps and your overall strategy at uh, Wood Forest? So thank you, um, Cliff. So two pieces around that that I think really directly apply where we're headed. And so first, with respect to DevSecOps, which is an outgrowth of DevOps, which is kind of an outgrowth of um, the attempt to add in new top line revenue driving features and capabilities very rapidly because that's the other part of the world that we live in is, is that if we want to drive our top line revenue up, if we want to increase our market share, um, customer acquisition and so forth, uh, we've got to put those features out there and put them out there quickly. So we've, we've discovered ways, the agile DevOps, DevSecOps, um, and certain architectures such as microservices, containerization and so forth. So those are all pieces that come to play together that allow us to very quickly respond to market needs and, and get items out there and be responsive to our customer, which drives top line revenue and top line business value. What I've found in the industry, not just in banking, but, but this, this shift is happening, it's being led by banking, I think, and by other, again, highly regulated industries, um, is, is we're, we're seeing now what I call the tectonic shift, a flip. And that is, is CIOs, CEOs are focusing more on risk reduction as much as they are focusing on a revenue driving strategy. So their, their, their focus is changing to a risk reduction strategy. And that is because the costs of a breach in terms of just the money and recovery and loss of uh, reputation, those costs have increased exponentially. Um, and so that, that causes at a CIO level or CEO level um, even at the board level to say, we're gonna shift our focus from a revenue driving strategy to a risk driving strategy. So these two pieces play together. On top of that, as you build these containerized architectures, you have what we call, um, it basically it reduces what's referred to as the blast radius or system contagion. The idea being that in the old model where you had implicit trust, once you're inside the gates of the fortress, you can go anywhere, we trust you. Um, but, but what that meant was, is if the bad guy got in, they could go anywhere. So the idea here is, is zero trust says, no, even if you've managed to breach one little segment of our population or our system, you're not going to be able to contain, we're going to contain you. System contagious is, contagion is contained within this small blast radius. And so that's the other big um, advantage of zero trust is that if, if there is a breach, it, it again, it's mitigated by the, the smallness of uh, and the contagion of the size of the blast. Thank you. And I, I think, you know, Janie represents, you know, a major corporation who security and trust is the centerpiece of the industry you chose to be in. Um, but I want to go to Monty now, where Monty is a startup and he's, his company, though security is important is perhaps also influenced and driven by other factors. And Monty, can you talk to us about some of those other factors a startup has to face and, and, and how you have to weigh that with your decision as to where you go with Zero Trust? Sure, and I gotta tell you, I, I think what Janie just said was, uh, she covered a lot of bases in there. That was uh, wonderful, Janie, how you just uh, brought it all home there. Uh, the blast radius is really how I see Zero Trust as well. I think that's a great way of describing it. The thing is, is uh, when you talk about a blast, there's that bomb up front. 
if what happens is zero trust impedes business operations, as well as security, any of your other operations. So when we talk about zero trust, is that every single layer within the OSI model? Is it every single lateral move uh, across the board so that registries, uh, any kind of handshake operation that's going on? So uh, understanding that risk reward factor is really super important. And the one thing I would say, uh, just to caveat with what Jamie said, was when we say we're pivoting from uh, revenue generating to risk, uh, I think what we really need to make sure is as security professionals that we can identify how risk can be quantified in that revenue profile. One of the things we've really suffered over the years is in our business, uh, the CISO and CIO tend to be second tier with uh, the rest of the C-suite because we talk about how important something is uh, and it's good that we can do it in terms of risk, but we've also got to be able to turn, do it in terms of profit, in terms of revenue generation, and how we maybe even be able to accelerate. And uh, if zero trust is something that can help us accelerate, because as a startup, as you were alluding to, Cliff, uh, as a startup, speed matters so much and getting to market matters so much and helping customers so that when we give our product that we can help accelerate them. That is something we're very focused on at Horizon 3. And I think a lot of people uh, in this new tech world, where, whether as we were pivoting towards uh, work from home and everything, being able to generate ideas in a fast manner matters so much. And so doing that in a zero trust environment, I think as long as it can, uh, and I, I need to pivot away from as long as, that's something a CIO and CISO have got to take into consideration when they're making decisions is uh, how much does speed matter? How much does the revenue matter? How much does my risk matter? And where those things all come together so that they can make a good decision going up. So I want to just pause right here. And, and Melissa, if you could put up the... Um survey here but you know i think the two panelists i have are you know with that defense background you know they're inherently already brainwashed for zero trust but not all of you are so i want to put up a panel just asking you where do you think this philosophy of zero trust is in your organization what influence is it having on you is this just a marketing trend or is this something you're truly embracing and see the reality of this may be something that we really have to take into uh, consideration and in our direction. So please take a look at the panel and, uh, excuse me, the, the survey and um, give us your answer. I think this, this could be interesting, but my suspicion is from my experience is many of you have heard about it. Many of you are thinking about it, but really haven't embraced it yet, unless you are really in, I think Janie put it in a good way, a highly regulated uh, environment or one that is generally the same thing, high safety requirements um, and super reputational uh, impact of a failure. And I think banks for sure, like you said, I mean, if your bank got compromised, your account got compromised or destroyed, I mean, the banks, it, it's a major disaster for the bank's goodwill value. So anyway, we'll take a look at that perhaps later, but I think what you can see right now is what I just said and predicted is you're just beginning the exploration of the concepts, okay? Not unusual. The question here now is, as I think Monty and Jamie were talking about, how long do you have to explore before you embrace? And so, you know, take that into consideration. You know, there's, there's opportunities to learn out there there's not a vendor out there who hasn't just like the cloud guy started to say, especially for the security world, oh, I deliver zero trust. You just have to take it in perspective. I do not believe from my experience, there's any one vendor who delivers the gambit. And that's why I showed you the slide of the 13 major capabilities. So take it into consideration. It's a holistic thinking process here. It's just like saying ERP and I do a finance system. Okay, it's a hell of a lot more than that. Um, I, some last quick questions. Do we have about five minutes left here in the panel? And I think uh, both of you, uh, Janie and Monty talked about it, but I'm gonna go back to Janie because I think Monty, you already did, but I'd like to hear Janie's opinion. What impact do you think zero trust will have on the roles and responsive CIOs and CISOs in the near future? 
Well, yes, and then, and as I mentioned, that that shift is already uh, starting to take place in terms of the the focus of whether or not it's going to be um, more of a revenue driving strategy versus a risk reduction strategy. But but I want to bring out the other piece of it too is, is make sure that what we're not putting here is is kind of like a, a binary either or. You either have the implicit trust model that's been in place forever that you know your your fortress is defined by your specific geographical parameters or your IP parameters versus zero trust that says we're having all these layers and nuances and other pieces and, and passing tokens and keys and so forth. It, it's not just an either or. And I think Cliff, you brought this out, but I wanna make sure we bring it home. It really does depend on the industry and their overall risk appetite and their risk profile um, and how much of that they're willing to to uh, basically trade off or even come in and, and introduce small parts at a time. Not unlike, again, to use your analogy of moving to the cloud, a lot of people initially did kind of a hybrid model with cloud services um, where they kind of transition a little at a time. And this would be something similar to that, but I think your risk profile and your appetite, risk for appetite, and, and again, as defined by your industry, is gonna be a big driver. And then the other one that Monty brought out, which I really liked as a, as a former UX engineer and human factors engineer, your other trade-off is ease of use. Um, you wanna basically, this is the age old issue we've always had. How do we make sure it's easy for the good guys to get in and keep the bad guys out? Um, and, and that's really what it bubbles right on down to. And Monty, your thoughts, especially from a new company and even your perspective, as you look at other companies you deal with as a startup? You bet. So I think as uh, some of the other companies, and we have a couple banks that we're dealing with, as uh, Janie said, very regulatory, but they've also got to be very service oriented. And so if it takes a long time from a mobile app, and I guess I go back to time because, as I said before, speed matters. Uh, having that identified, and we've seen from uh, uh, several, you can look back at whether it was Wells Fargo or others, where they've got to rethink their entire approach to security because they cannot afford to, do, to have something like that happen again. So uh, now is that, you know, Hunter likes to ask the question, is it a great time to be in our business right now? And I got to tell you, what a great time to be in our business because for the for a lot of, a long time, cybersecurity professionals were telling them why this matters. Now the CEOs are saying, "Hey, this matters. Tell me how you're going to bring value to the business because you have my attention." What a great time for us to be bringing this up. And whether you're small, middle, or large, uh, the opportunities are great right now. Yeah, I, I think one of the big points I want to make out, point out that both you and, and Janie mentioned was zero trust is a big thing. This is a transformation of an approach to security, but you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all in one step tomorrow. OK, I think you have to find out what fits for your company. Start the learning, figure out your risk tolerance, where your risk is, which attributes of zero trust fit you and how do you roll it in? It's probably gonna take you multiple years to get your company transformed to this new approach. Um, and, and just don't take it as overwhelming. I mean, just put your toe in there and get started. So um, just to close out here in our last minute, um, any closing remarks, Janie? And then we'll ask Monty. Um, no, I really don't have anything to add other than don't be frightened of this. It sounds scary, um, but it really isn't. And uh, there, it's a very low barrier to entry to learn more and start engaging. Thank you, Jane. And I'll just chime in. I think as any of us, uh, don't be afraid to kill your sacred cows. When, when you're writing, they say to kill your darlings. Sometimes we all have our sacred cows and people, it doesn't matter whether you're a network guy who can't imagine going to the cloud because I need to touch my server. Being able to take a different perspective on things is invaluable and we can all grow from that. So I would definitely say uh, uh, whether it's this model or others, we might have to kill a few sacred cows and to grow from there. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, it was, uh, I really appreciate your input. And I think we gave three very diverse per, uh, perspectives from the industry about a common problem. Hunter, to you. Hey, one sec there. Well, there we go. Um, great, great panel. Great job, guys. Janie, great to meet you. Uh, Monty, always solid. Cliff, you always blow me away. Thanks. Great job. Um,
Thank you so much. Hey, next up, uh, we have the HMG Tech Innovation Lab, our innovation accelerator. Uh, and for today, we literally have one really cool company, uh, uh, the CEO and founder, Snehal Antani. Snehal, uh, welcome uh, to the program. All right, Hunter, thanks, I appreciate it. This is gonna be an easy win. Oh man, this is my, uh, as long as I outperform the others on this call, we're good. We're good. Hey, a little context. Uh, of your career here. Um, I'm not sure if we've been in the Houston market, maybe maybe months ago we did a short thing on uh, in the Houston summit, but a uh, little context, a little back to your, uh, your corporate background uh, in, in terms of what IBM, we met when you were at IBM, then GE, then Splunk, and then DOD. Yeah, absolutely. So, so 100, 100 and I go back almost 10 years now. Um, my background is I was a software engineer by training and trade, working at IBM on WebSphere and other middleware products. Uh, got the experience of building and launching products and being on the road as a trusted advisor to financial services and so on. Spent some quality time in, in, in Houston in that job. I then left to be a CIO at GE Capital, and that's when I really got to engage the network. Um, for me, as a first-time CIO back in 2012, I didn't know what I didn't know. And there aren't a whole lot of books that you're gonna go read to, to understand the true authentic CIO experience and cultivating the right network for me at the time was critical uh, to my success. And so I've had three different CIO jobs since at GE Capital. Uh, I then went on to join Splunk as the CTO and help drive some high growth activities over um, in Silicon Valley. I then decided to take a break from industry and I decided to serve. So I took a break from industry and I joined the special operations community within the Department of Defense and uh, applied a lot of my CIO experience in driving digital transformation, but doing so in support of national security. And it was the hardest, most meaningful work of my career. My wife reminded me daily the sudden change of my W-2 income. Uh, but you know, if you treat it like uh, going to grad school or going to get your MBA, two and a half years of pretty intense leadership lessons surrounded by some of the most incredible people in the world uh, is, is invaluable. And uh, from that experience, I saw an opportunity to start a company. And I uh, went off and started Horizon 3, which does continuous automated pen testing and red team operations. And uh, building on the, on the zero trust discussion, how do we understand our environment through the eyes of the attacker? And how do we use that perspective to prioritize our defensive actions, to uh, exercise and understand the effectiveness of our tools and processes? and focus on fixing security problems that actually matter. And that was really the thesis that I built up. But that's kind of my career background and, and first time founder, once again, relying on the network to help make sure I see around the corners. Awesome. And so what's the real problem that you're addressing? So the issue is that when, when I had my CIO role and, and other jobs that I had, attackers knew more about my environment than I did. And it was very frustrating because we had logged everything, we instrumented everything, yet somehow they were getting in, they were maneuvering, they were stealing data, and attackers knew more than I did. So I had a visibility issue. And number two is they weren't hacking in uh, using zero days like you'd see in the movies. They were logging in with valid credentials and other things that they were able to effectively harvest. And so in the military, there's this idea of looking at your battle plans through the eyes of the adversary or through the eyes of the enemy so you can find your weaknesses and your blind spots. And so how do we apply that same principle to cybersecurity? So if I look at my environment through the eyes of the attacker, I can understand how they chain together uh, hard, uh, valid credentials that they found, user IDs and passwords, uh, vulnerabilities that are actually exploitable and misconfigurations that enable uh, uh, data theft or systems disruption. And if I can understand how an attacker combines those things together, I'll be able to better defend. And kind of the final point is attackers aren't using the nines and 10 vulnerabilities that we're focused on patching as defenders. What attackers do is they combine together those low and medium vulnerabilities that in aggregate are critical. And that's why they continue to execute successful cyber attacks because we're focused on almost the compliance checkbox behavior of fix the, the top high risk issues, but it's the low risk issues in, in aggregate that are still the, uh, really big threat to us. Wow, fascinating stuff. Uh, how's it going? How's the startup going for you? 
So, uh, so far, excellent. I said, first time uh, founder for me. Uh, half of my the, the team are, are veterans that are former special operations, uh, former airmen, and so on. Uh, you saw Monty on the call. He's a, a recently retired colonel from the Air Force. So we've got really deep subject matter expertise with really high-end uh, um, offensive and defensive cyber knowledge. And I paired them with startup engineers that know how to build and ship high-quality enterprise software. And we are a software as a service. So there's no consultants, no professional services, continuous automated pen testing. So that's a very hard problem to go after. Uh, we, we started the company a year and a half ago. We delivered the alpha and the beta programs on time. We launched the product a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're on, uh, on path to, to be probably one of the fastest growing cybersecurity startups ever in how quickly we've been able to hit certain revenue milestones. Uh, and so, so far, so good. And once again, part of that success is having a network of uh, founders, CIOs, advisors, and so on around me to help me see my blind spots. Awesome. Uh, and what were those blind spots? Uh, so it's funny, you know, with my CIO hat on, I, and I'm sure many of my colleagues have aspired to, to go be the entrepreneur, go start a company, but we've always operated in the comfort of a large company. You know, I had IBM, like I didn't, I didn't have to worry about what payroll software I was going to use to run the company. I wasn't worried about funding to make sure I could make payroll or how to hire at scale and all those kinds of things. I had the IBM infrastructure to support me. I had the GE infrastructure to support me or the Splunk infrastructure and so on. So when you start a company, I mean, you are starting from scratch. Like you are legally signing a articles of incorporation. You are, there are a whole bunch of things I'd never done before. And, you know, being able to ask uh, founders, hey, what, what payroll software did you use to get up and running? Or how did you um, structure your hiring? Or how did you structure this or that or the other thing? Or from a buyer standpoint, going to CIOs that I know are early adopters and saying, hey guys, like, am I on to something? Does this sound like a legitimate idea? I mean, I'm putting a lot on the line to start a company. Is this good? Is this bad? Give me the feedback. So being able to go to founders to understand how to just start a company and then going to known early adopters in the CIO community to get that rapid feedback to drive product market fit, both of those have been absolutely invaluable. Now you have a pretty good pipeline lined up, I understand. Uh, yeah, so it's actually pretty interesting. What we found with, with this continuous pen testing type behavior is if you have uh, no CISO whatsoever, you don't have a real security team, you're still early or you're a small or medium-sized company, you don't know where to start. You don't know what problems are that you've got to go focus on fixing. And so for those, for those types of customers, think small medical facilities, uh, law firms, and so on, they're using us to do that initial assessment to identify the problems that they've got to go fix. And then they'll run our um, pen tests every day or every week to find problems, prioritize those problems. They will go off and fix them. And then they'll rerun the pen test to verify that those problems have actually been resolved. And that's at the smaller medium size. If you take a very large enterprise that has a sophisticated internal pen testing organization with external consultants that they use, the problem they have is coverage. If you've got 20 people that are pen testers in your company, when you're a very large shop, you know, you're a big oil and gas company or whatever else, you're not gonna be able to get to a hundred percent coverage of your organization unless you hire a hundred more pen testers. So what they're using us for is to not to, to run a pen test against everything and maximize coverage and find all of the low hanging fruit, straightforward problems to go fix. And they're using their exquisite human talent to focus on the really hard areas and problems to go probe deeper on. So what's cool in our pipeline is uh, whether you're a small medical facility with no security leader, just you know, uh, network engineers that need to fix problems, or you're a sophisticated banker, oil and gas company that has a very mature security shop, uh, they're using the exact same product in each of those extreme use cases and everything in between. So you think about product market fit as a founder, Having one product that you can repeatedly sell to such a wide range of customers is a gold mine. Awesome. Great job. Uh, exciting times for you, huh? I would guess. Yeah. It's, um, as I said, I learn something every day. Uh, probably the biggest part of success is the team itself and being able to hire the right folks around you where you don't need to micromanage them. You don't need to babysit them. 
They're all self-starters. They're starters. They're all deep subject matter experts. And you're able to help set some direction, empower them and enable them to execute, and then get out of their way and let them go apply their unique skills. I mean, those are honestly the same. That's the same belief and principles I learned when I spent time in the Special Operations Committee, which was a bottoms up empowered decentralized organization whose goal was to empower and enable the right people um, to move out. That's what led to our success at GE Capital when we ran our transformation, empower and enable the right people to move out. And it absolutely holds true as a, as a founder of a startup. Love it. Um, how can people get started with you, Snell? Uh, so uh, we should soon be on the marketplace. We're still working through some last minute things there. Uh, uh, portal.horizon3ai.com. Uh, you can go run a self-service pen test against your home or against your organization for free. Uh, we'll follow up uh, and offer, you know, in these tough times, you are required for regulatory reasons to run a pen test, whether it's in bank or oil and gas or PCI or other compliance reasons. And so um, we'll give you a free pen test uh, so that you can probably reduce some of your consulting spend free up some of your budget this year and give you that immediate value just because you're part of the HMG network. Uh, and so we'll send a follow-up to the, to the audience here. And hopefully uh, if it's something we can help you with, then uh, you can absolutely capitalize on it. Now I would imagine uh, given your GE background, you know, you know, a bunch of the GE guys, the GE energy uh, team in the Dow in the Houston market for some time, like Anoop and uh, Chris Gates and others. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the really good technologists at GE tended to all know each other because we're all trying to help each other get better. So in capital at GE Energy and, and some of the other divisions. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. There's some great talent that's in the company and that's scattered from the company over the last couple of years. And it's pretty awesome to see where these alumni have landed since. Very cool. Hey, Snell, thanks for coming on the program and uh, looking forward to seeing you again uh, soon. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate it. Great job. Hey, so that's a wrap, uh, folks, for today's summit. Uh, hopefully, you really enjoyed the program. I thought the agenda was amazing. Uh, the speakers were fantastic. The interviews were ex excellent. Uh, the panels were solid. Uh, really looking at that whole intersection of innovation, disruption, reimagining, reinventing the customer journey, and reinventing business models. Really uh, the best time ever to be a, a CIO tech leader uh, in our industry. Um, our time's come. Uh, it really has. And uh, really appreciate everyone pitching in there. Tony, I see Tony Lang still on the line. Tony, you want to uh, turn your camera on just for one second and say hello? Uh, you're still there. It's uh, really a fascinating time in our industry, folks. Uh, probably the most interesting, uh, the most competitive. And as Tony called it, there'll be heroes and villains. Uh, I would think there are going to be a lot of rock stars and a lot of new rock stars born. So, uh, you know, in final, in wrapping up, I'd like to thank the Houston Sim Chapter. Uh, you guys are great. You're amazing to work with. Really enjoy it. It was fun and uh, really exciting to support the, the annual golf tournament recently. And um, Data Stacks, as well as Remini Street, uh, great job, folks. Really appreciate the support. And I want to uh, ask August uh, Plicio to come out. August, in addition to our social media, uh, August uh, helps run uh, and lead the recognition program the top tech executives that matter uh, recognition program. This is going to roll up into a, a global program, folks, in early of early March of uh, 2021. Um, and we're looking for champions, right? August uh, champions in the marketplace to nominate other tech leaders to the advisory board, other tech leaders to speak at, at summits in 2021, and possibly other tech leaders to be looked at to uh, be recognized. August? That's right. Yeah. So we've been doing this, uh, what, 12 years now, Hunter, the recognition? Correct. So, uh, you know, we've really learned a lot about what what qualifies these uh, global technology leaders as the ones that really stand out and matter. So we're excited to recognize them in a new uh, and global and, and more uh, built out way uh, in the first quarter of next year. So uh, stay in touch on social media to learn more about it as we keep developing the program. Um, in terms of our Houston recipients today, I'd first like to welcome Paul Kruger back onto the screen. Paul, we all heard from Paul in a panel earlier. Great job today, Paul. Good to see you. Thanks. So Paul is now an executive leader at J.B. Poindexter and Company. That's his new title. I don't know if you heard his explanation earlier, but Paul comes from a really impressive uh, career in IT. Was it about 30 years now almost uh, in IT? 
Uh, no, it, it, I, I wish it was only 30, but uh, I'll go with that. <laughs> uh, well, first CIO role came in, uh, in about 1997, right? That's correct. So 23 years as a CIO. Okay. Paul's specialty has been for uh, driving for continuous improvement within large manufacturing and service corporations. Uh, he's taken on executive leadership roles at GE, uh, Stuart and Stevenson, and most recently now J. Beam Poindexter. Uh, Paul remained courageous and authentic through the global pandemic that we saw this year. Uh, he understood the adversities, he saw the opportunities, and he rolled his sleeves up. I remember he joined us on a, a conference over this summer and said, this is the time to shine. Communicate that to your teams and you will continue to build trust. Paul, we love having you on the program. Amazed by the work that you're doing. Congratulations on this award. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, you've been Thank a great you. fan and supporter of HMG over the years in Houston. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, that's what it's all about is staying connected and uh, being part of this uh, incredible industry. Yeah, Hunter, it's been a, a lot of fun over the years uh, being with uh, HMG and uh, being part of these conferences, uh, both in, uh, in person and virtual. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Uh, I've always learned a lot from your conferences, so really appreciate it. Awesome. Stay in touch, Paul. Good to see you. You bet. Take care, guys. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to welcome Venu Maduri onto the screen. Venu, if you are able to make it, just, hey, hey, Venu, how are you today? Hey, August. Doing good? It's good to see you. So Venu is the CIO of Mears Group. And although we consider him a Houston rock star, he really is a global leader. Um, his 20 plus years in the industry span across uh, multiple industries, multiple countries, multiple technologies. Uh, but plus, he's a genuinely interpersonal person. His leadership style is a strong focus on execution. It's helped uh, bring speed and effectiveness to the teams that he's worked with. And he credits this to a combination of strategic planning, reliable technology partners, executive leadership support, and user involvement for delivering the rapid digital transformation to manage his team and their business effectively uh, in this critical year. Benny, very well said. Uh, congratulations on receiving this award. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you, August. Yeah, it's been a great year for us. Uh, we were, uh, we didn't imagine, we were thinking that uh, the rollouts of all of our initiatives are going to take much longer, very painful rollout process, change management process. So, um, you know, COVID came and everybody went, went remote. So digital had to be the way. So luckily the rollout uh, was a lot more smoother. Uh, so it's been a great year for us. Um, again, great team. I, I have a fantastic team with me. So I, um, I accept the award on their behalf. I'm, I'm just the titular head here. They are the ones. We do a little bit about Mears Group uh, for folks that might not know it that well. Um, so we are in the um, oil and gas uh, uh, pipeline business. So we basically build the pipelines. So we build um, uh, large diameter, small diameter pipelines, both for distribution as well as transmission, mostly in the distribution space. We have a fairly large market share in the distribution space. Uh, so utilities are our major customers. And then uh, uh, some of the trans big transmission companies are also our customers. Excellent. Hey, great so job and congratulations. To manage it. Thank Thanks you. so much, Manu. Okay. It's been a great panel today, Hunter. I've been, uh, I've uh, heard all, uh, most of it. Um, it's a great panel. What you do is really insightful. You know, we, we all, all we all get invited to many things, and I'll I'll not take too much time. But uh, you know, when you go to a meeting or, or a conference, if you can pick like two or three things from that meeting, then you know your day is well worth it, right? You come to these meetings that you run, uh, and again, I'm not trying to be you know uh, sick or fancy here, but I really learn those two three things in a very short amount of time. So great panels that you have. Um, I mean, the, the one on um, uh, diversity today was was really great. A diversity of thought, like Myra said. So, and Jesse said. So, it's a great panel. We learn a lot of things from these things. Excellent. Hey, we appreciate your loyalty and your commitment. And uh, you know, it's really all about making everyone's making making everyone better, right? Being be a better yep. leader, being a better business person, a better technologist, better in the C-suite, the seat with the CEO and the boardroom and the line of business. Um, you know, I had this dream of this company 30 years ago and literally uh, had the resources 
to pull it off. We rolled out in 08, 09, 2010, a pretty bad economy. Houston was early on in our build in 09, 2010. And, you know, everything's cyclical up and down, right? Um, uh, I would just say that these are just so unprecedented times that we're in right now. We're uncharted waters and you really want to stay connected more than ever. And so thanks to your testimonial, I actually think we cover in two hours more uh, really hardcore key topics in a tight package than anyone else does out there. So a little biased myself, but it's, uh, it's this whole intersection of leadership, innovation, disruption, reimagining the customer and business model journey. It, 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 that's, that's what it's all about right now in order to strive and thrive. Yeah. So thanks. Great. Hey, August, great job. Um, again, we're looking for champions in the marketplace. Really appreciate the partnership with Houston Sim, the advisory board, uh, the conference chairs. Great job, folks. And uh, we'll be looking forward to get coming back here in uh, 2021. Right around the corner, though, uh, we have events almost every week. You can dial in at any uh, on any of the Zoom casts. Uh, we also have a Women in Technology Summit coming up in a couple of weeks, or one week, sorry a global uh, Women in Technology Summit, our first ever. I think that's really fascinating. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna be doing uh, a, a, an advisory board, global advisory board happy hour. Uh, when you're invited, please, uh, please join us. Take care and be safe, thanks.